You're listening to the Michael Geeky Podcast. All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Myco Geeky Podcast, the podcast that goes deep so you can level up your at-home mushroom cultivation game. I'm your host, Myco Geeky, and tonight, uh, Monday night, 9 p.m., here we go, ready to do it again. We got a nice grab bag tonight. Uh, we're gonna do, we're gonna go exotic. Then we're then we're gonna talk to uh, one of my buddies, one of my neighbors, uh, who, who's one of the great uh, vendors out there right now, and uh, <clears throat> doing some interesting things. Um, and then we're going to uh, revisit an old friend, uh, someone who was on. Uh, he was truly my absolute first person who ever did uh, very early podcasts, not even available, um, had had a bunch of technical difficulties. Uh, but we have had him on since, uh, Gary Hefferly. So he's going to be on. Uh, it's going to be a good show. Um, so before we get into it, though, uh, let me just go ahead. I want to reiterate, this is new thing, so I'm going to pull it back up this week and uh, talk through that mission statement. I really want to make sure my audience knows what we're here for. Um, so here we go. Mission statement. Educate and inspire mushroom cultivators and enthusiasts on the art and science of mushroom cultivation. While delving into the medicinal, therapeutic, and societal aspects of mushrooms, including discussions on integration therapy, spirituality, and the decriminalization movement. That's it. That's what we're doing. Just all that. I'll probably be here for 10, 20 years, guys. <clears throat> and then it's all legal and we can move on. Great. Anyway, that's what that's what we're here for. That's what I'm trying to do. Um, and I got a lot of people helping me out. I got some great people on my Discord. Always shout out to my mods. Um, uh, I think we're going to get the mods on here pretty soon. We're going to have a mod pod. We're going to do that mod podcast. It's going to be fun. Um, uh, but tonight, uh, you know, we're 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 gonna crunch it out here. Uh, this is uh, pre-recorded, guys. This is this is the the new format. Let's see how it goes. Uh, again, shout out to my Patreon supporters. I think I got over seventy Patreon supporters at this point. Uh, I really appreciate you guys. You guys, like I said, are paying the bills and uh, get getting some of my gear paid off. And once I get in the green, um, sky's the limit. We're gonna have to take some trips. We're gonna have to do some, you know, day in the life. We're going to wander around the woods somewhere. We're going to have some fun. So, uh, and it's all because of you guys, you guys are making it happen. So I really appreciate it. Also want to shout out all the people, uh, last episode, um, you know, did a lot of super stickers and stuff like that, that, that support means the world to me. So thank you so much. Um, so now let, let's get into it. So, uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome to the show, Sila Vibe. What's up, man? What's up, Marco fam? All right, let me let me pull up uh let me pull up your uh overlay there. Now, by the way, that that logo who who did that logo? Man, uh, I drew it actually. Uh, I uh, I drew that logo. I actually did. I like I've that. drawn a, I've drawn a couple different logos, but that's the one I've drawn that I want to go with. I need. I, I'm still haven't gotten to, gotten around to getting it like. Uh, to getting on the computer and right. you know like digitizing it and getting it you know the way I really wanted that you know cool, man. It. but yeah, hopefully well, so I'll be able to hopefully I'll get that hopefully I'll be able to do that pretty soon and get it you know get right. get it you know done on the computer with like a graphic designer or something so I can start getting some stickers made and some slaps yeah, and stuff. stickers man we 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 love slaps in this community I still no call doubt. them stickers I'm like you I'm people like no slap doubt. slaps i'm like you mean stickers okay anyway yeah, slap already. stickers whatever it is we, we love them we got you know we got put some on the side of our flow hoods and all that stuff so yeah my flow um, hoods covered in them <laughs> covered yeah um all right so uh, let me just tell the audience so i think uh Silla vibe hit my radar uh after an instagram post where he was talking about some of his locally found um cubes and i just liked how he was talking about them uh, he was connecting it to his region. He was showing some reverence for the Native American culture that came before him. And I just, I, it just, you know, piqued my curiosity. So so I followed this guy and, and was like, okay, I'm going to keep an eye on this guy. And then I saw that he grew Zapticorum. And I was like, okay, we're going to have to be friends. It's that easy. So so we've chit-chatted quite a bit. Um, 
you know, he's always just grinding and, and trying to grow exotics and some of his lo local uh, cubes. And uh, we, we've we been trying to make this happen for a while. We, we're finally doing it. So I'm ex really excited to have you here, man. Hi, man. I'm excited to be here, brother. I'm so, really excited to be here. So we're going to get into it right away. Let's start with, I mean, you grow a lot of stuff, but we're going to start with Zaps. Um, and for uh, those of you who don't know. Zapotecorum, Zapotecorum yeah, my Zapotecorum, favorite species. Zapotecorum. Yes, sir. They, uh, uh, they, they, they are a sexy little mushroom. They are a beautiful species, and um, no other species like them, man. With that flocko stem, that's not that beautiful scaly the stem. Stem is sad. that, all that convex cap. Uh, there's just no other mushroom, no other celosa be like them, in my I'm opinion. And, and like right, where they go, picture. I'm a, I'm gonna pull up a picture for everybody. This is courtesy of Alan Rockefeller. Pretty sure he did some stacking on this one because it's just a vivid image. But this, so Syllavibe's talking about that stem. You guys can all see the stipe. Sorry. Um, you guys can all see it's just the shaggy. It's like really a scaly look to cool it. Cool stem, yes. And then, the, and then the caps are usually convex like that. Like those are beautiful. Those, yeah. those are beautiful. And those are, that's crazy too because, you know, they're normally like almost always found, you know, because they're known as the Durumbe, the landslide mushroom. They're, they're normally found at the bottom of landslides and like ravines and stuff like that. But every once in a while, they can be found just like at the base of like oak trees and stuff like that. I know my homie found uh, down in Mexico last year, actually found, found something like that, just growing out like that on a trail or something down in Mexico, of course. I don't know. Yeah. I can't remember where at, but. Now, it's interesting you bring that up because somebody else recently brought this up. They were um, somebody showed a, a mushroom. They were trying to get an ID on it. And somebody said one thing and then somebody else said, oh, well, it couldn't be that because, you know, they, they're wood lovers. They're, they're going to grow on a tree and that's not a tree. And then it might even have been Alan Rockefeller. I can't remember. But somebody chimed in and said, you know, there can be wood particulate. There can be wood debris in the ground. Well, so. I mean, the whole thing about. Uh... The whole thing about Zapotecorum growing in landslides is what they like is that, you know, they don't like new landslides. You know, they like an older landslide or an older ravine. And what they do is they feed off all the wood, woody debris that's, you know, collected in the bottom, you know, in the bottom of that ravine or the bottom of that landslide. Like that's what they feed off of. Um, I mean, I know uh, a lot of people. Um, or not a lot of people, but a few people, you know, when they grow them, they, you know, add wood to their substrate, right. you know, because like, a, you know, in the wild, they're basically feeding off of wood or, you know, woody substances that are in, you know, in the, in the, uh, uh, in the so ravine or whatever, yeah. Yeah. in the pot, in the, yeah, in the uh, landslide. And, um, but at the, but you do not have to, but it does not, you don't have to, you don't have to have wood. It's not to totally mandatory. To do that's, it indoors. that's been your experience. I think that's been a couple other people's experience. I've talked like about. I've done both. Uh, I've done two tubs so far, two tubs of Zapotecorum. Um, and uh, both tubs were grown on just C CV, Cococorum vermiculite. That's, that was it. Both tubs were. I didn't add anything extra. didn't add anything special. Just did that. I mean, and I've kind of cased it, of course. I cased it with a with a special casing layer and uh, peat moss and vermiculite and a little bit of sand, and uh, they love it. Well, we'll we'll get into your specific cultivation stuff in in a little bit here, but um, I, I just want to quickly go over that you know this this is a really historic psilocybin containing mushroom. Oh it's, yeah, man. I mean, it, this it is the much way back. I mean, this was used by the Aztecs. I yeah. mean, it's it's named after the Zapotecos Indians. Yeah. I mean, it was. I mean, used by the Mazatec Indians. I mean, it has been. It's been used for you know centuries, basically. You know, I mean, it's still being used up to this day. I mean, every time I mean, I've tripped on. I mean, I'm I'm still using them. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I'm sure they're still using them down there. You know, and in, in the you know the region the regions down there in southern Mexico, in the cloud forests and stuff. And so that I think that's just such a beautiful thing to you know because like you say, it's a historic mushroom. You know, to me, that's what makes it so special because it's you know it's. It's the Durumbe, 
you know, it's, you know, it, it was, you know, one of the, uh, for a while there, it was one of the, um, you know, the, uh, the Maztec Indians recognized, a f- you know, a few, uh, separate mushrooms and, you know, like the Durumbe is the Solosibi Zapatacorum or Solosibi K. Rulescens. And then, you know, you know, they have, they, uh, Pajaritos, which is, you know, Solosibi Mexicana. And, uh, but yeah, those are just some of the ones that are, yeah. you know, but they have, but you know, there's so many, it's, you know, it's like almost an endless number of a species of mushrooms that grow down there. There's so many stylosophies that grow down there. It's crazy. And I, I myself have never been down there. Don't go, no, right. don't We're get me wrong. I, I would We're love to. to I'm, and I'm going to try to get down there as soon as possible, but I haven't been myself. I just, you know, I've studied it. You know, I, mm-hmm. that's, I feel like, you know, to get a, you got to get a connection and study these things and study these people and that, you know, I've used it and study all these things to be able to really cultivate it. It takes some knowledge and you know, some history. You got to really kind of know the history and knowledge of the species because it's, uh, to me, it's the most beautiful philosophy and it's, it's just something special about it. I've taken several different philosophies, you know, and pan, I've taken pan, pan cyans, I've taken, uh, you know, uh, ATL seven, lots of different exotics, mm-hmm. you know, and I, nothing has ever compared to the Zapatacorn. All right, well, let's talk about that a little bit. So, uh, th- this way we can get people enticed about. Okay, it might be harder to grow, but here might be a reason to grow. So, try your best to explain how it's unique in its medicinal effects. Um, it's definitely more spiritual. Okay. And it's very, very visual. And to me, that's one of my favorite aspects of, uh, you know, of the, of the psilocybin experience right. is the visual effect. You know, you know, the scene, you know, every the colors become more bright and more vibrant and, you know, patterns, you know, coming out of, you know, nowhere, basically, uh, I just, I've had some very intense experiences with them off of some very low doses. I'm talking like a quarter of a gram, you know, it sent me to Mars. Like I'm not even playing and it's not, all. they're not always, you know, that strong. Like sometimes I might take a quarter of a gram and it might not get me to where I want to be, but there's been times I have taken that low of a dose of Zapatacorn and it's, you know, most mushrooms, there ain't many, you know, suicide mushrooms out there I've taken so far that, uh, that low of a dose would get me where I wanted to be. You know, the lowest I've taken, you know, to get me where I'd want to be at has been with like subtrops or pans, which is like half a gram. And, but, you know, you know, zaps it's a little bit, you know, I mean, I got a little bit more juice. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, so Jordan Jacobs, we've had him on the show. He, he runs the HPLC, uh, test. Shout out uh, Jordan. Company. Shout out to Jordan. He, um, he, you know, when I ordered a, a print from, from him, that's where I got my here. I'll pull it up on the screen. You know, that that's my zap culture. I'm working right now. Hold on. Beautiful culture, beautiful culture. Nice, even growth. That's, and that's, that's like all true. He hooked me up, man. So, but he, so he did HPLC on it and he said, uh, you know, it's, it's a potent mushroom. It's it's a very consistently potent mushroom. So, um, you know, uh, in in our underground world, uh, people maybe sometimes even get a little too hung up on potency. But but in this case, uh, you're saying it's not even just the potency. It's the, yeah, it's, it's no, different. it's not just the potency. There's something about it that just I don't know. Like the really, I can't put it into words. Right. Like I mean, if there, I, think I wish that's was, normal. Like when people. <laughs> I love reading trip reports or I love hearing people talk about their trips, but I'm almost like, it's, it's almost impossible. I don't even know how to explain it. Like how you're going to explain it. It really is like, it, it really is it's such a hard thing to explain, but there's just something right. about them that's super special. And, uh, I also believe, you know, I believe a lot of the mushrooms down there, like the subtropicalis has that effect too, as well. And, but like, uh, like I said, like Zapatacorn and, uh, what I'm really interested in, you know, coming up next is going to be K lessons. I really, I'm really interested we'll in talk that. About them. Yep. Uh, All right. So, but, uh, so we'll, we'll get into subtrops. We'll get into, uh, 
Hero lessons, but but we're we're gonna stay. Let's let's keep moving into a little deeper on uh your experience uh cultivating Zappa decorum so far. So it, you know, I I know you're you're friends with uh Mind Spirit Contact. Oh yeah, look at that right there, lovely. Yeah, beautiful. One of the most uh trying to get that on the camera. There we go. If you, if you put your hand and then hold it in front, that that'll help it focus. That's pretty good. Mm -hmm. not too bad so uh, all right so so those grow are not, those are not big beautiful ones the caps are <laughs> nice and convex yeah. they're nice flocko stem just with like a uh, textbook you know they're lovely all right so let's talk about Appreciate let's it. talk about growing them what okay you, you source genetics from mind spirit contact at first right Yes, sir. Shout, shout out to Mind Spirit Contact. Shout out to the homie, man. Shout out to the to my teacher. Shout out man, a million times, man. I love that dude. Yeah, I love we, him. We got Mind Spirit. He's coming on too. We, he, I can't wait too. for that. I can't yeah. wait for that. So he's taught me literally. I mean, he's been like my you know my mentor when it comes to Zappa Decorum. Uh, it was actually seeing a few of his Zappa Decorum. Uh, grows at first that got me so interested in zappa decorum and me and him started chopping it up and talking and uh, i started asking him and he started teaching me things and you know telling me things and he literally never uh you know there was never a question that he he didn't answer for me you know there's no you know he he really guided me on and put me on the right path and uh um, the path. I mean, I, I'm going to say guitar. you, so you too, when I talk to both of you guys, you guys are real grounded dudes. You guys like you, it isn't just like, Oh bro, the potency, bro. There, no, it's, like not about, real it's not all about for this that. mushroom. It's, it's, it's really special. I'm telling you, I talked to a lot of people. You guys are so grounded. You guys clearly consider this a sacred mushroom. Um, and, yes. and you guys are nurturing that same attitude. I mean, I, I feel all these uh, psilocybin containing mushrooms have have a sacred quality to them, but oh yeah, they definitely all really have a sacred quality. But there's just something about zappa decorum. I don't know what it is, and and before that, you know, that was before I'd ever tasted it, before I'd ever tried it, you know, before any before anything like that. I was just so drawn to it, you know. I you know I saw it, and I was, saw that flocko stem and that beautiful convex cap that hangs down, and I was yeah. just like. Man, all those are you know gorgeous. I got a you know, I mean, I didn't know these could be grown indoors, and then you know, and so I started, you know, to talk and talking to him about it, and we start, we you know, we started, he started teaching me things, and and uh, I started studying, you know, and you know, just reading all night, you know, sometimes on the you know online, and you know, just gathering as much information as I could because you know, like knowledge is power, knowledge is the key. You know, it's, you know, the more knowledge you can gain on any subject, you know, that is, you know, it's going to empower you. That's and, really smart because when you're embarking on trying to grow something that very few people grow, I mean, it is known that people have grown it, but but it's not a lot of people. So no, that, like I read about, I like I read about like like what kind of trees grow down there. I read about like what kind of you know everything like right. the you know the you know the temperature everything and um and because those, those things make a huge difference in cultivation like they're not these are they're, they're you know these ain't like these ain't like just uh throwing some cube grain you know throwing some uh grains in a tub of cubes you know these, these ain't like you know you know pop up in two weeks you know you gotta have some patience you gotta have some knowledge and you gotta have that love for it and if you don't have all those three things, you're not going to be you're successful. Yeah, you're going to give up. All right. Well, let's let's take a look at some pictures, and, and then oh, we'll really? get into uh, then we'll get into some specifics. Um. So, all right, let's start out here. All right, what do we got here? All right, that right there is a uh, um from it's my, one of the first Zapatacorum uh plates I ever worked. It was it's one of the multi spore plates from the Popo Capital Volcano collection that I received from Mind Spirit Contact. And that's about I think a one transfer away from where I actually uh spawned to that. Okay. All right. So and here's another Yeah, plate. as you can see it's that was actually the plate 
this is actually the plate before that plate right there. And then, uh, or before that last plate. And then there we go. That's the, that, that was the final plate. That was the one that got spawned. Looks clean. Now, I'm not going to lie. Yours, maybe it's just because it was a green agar, but, um, I'm I'm looking. Yours looks. I think it's just the the agar color because uh, my mycelium. There is a bit of a tint to the zap uh, mycelium. I have not in my experience, especially if a plate gets a little bit older. There's a little like of a, a kind of a, a tannish, yeah, yeah like a tan, tan kind yeah. of creamish kind of color. Yeah, I yeah I agree hundred percent. As they get older, they then especially the as they point, get especially yeah. as they get older, especially yeah. as they get older. All right, so then here here we go. So this is, what's significant about this fruit here? This is the cluster. This is the pop. This is the cluster found at the base of the Popo Capital volcano, okay. by Mind Spirit Contact. That this is the cluster he printed, that uh, and that he sent me this sheet of prints from this cluster, and that's okay. um, I think I worked the print from that one right there because a lot of mine ended up with caps that were. Uh, concave instead of convex like they normally are and uh but no uh these are some of the most beautiful zaps i've ever seen and i remember thinking that when i seeing these pictures and then he sent me the sheet of the prints and uh it was like you know spread the love share the love you know you know and you know work hard on these and like it felt like a duty <laughs> you know what i mean i was like got mind spirit sent me these you know these are beautiful i gotta do something with these you know yeah i, I can i can agree uh you know it, when i first got into it you get a lot of spores you get a lot of prints you get swabs you get cultures um of cubensis but when yeah. you start getting some of the other ones uh you know you i have some where i'm like i don't know if i'm ever going to be able to grow this but i can't let go of the culture Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I like don't ever culture. let go of it because, yeah. you know, you could, you yeah. know, you may or know you might gain the knowledge one day to be able to do that. Exactly. All right. Or someone go. else might gain that knowledge and you can, you know, get it from them. Right. If we all work together. Yes. And that's how we need, you know, that's what we need to do. You know what I mean? Like, I, like, you know, me and Mind Spirits, you know, that was, that's been our goal, you know, was to share the love and spread the love, you know, you know, and that's what we've tried to do. And like it said, like you, like you can see, it says right there, wild psilocybe zapatocorn growing in the washout gully at the base of the Popo Capital volcano somewhere in the cloud forest of Southern Mexico. Awesome. And, uh, so you can even, I can tell on the previous picture and this one, it really is in, like you said, a zone that at some point in time, there were heavy rains. There was like Yeah, a it's like a washout or, gully. Like a it's like a little gully, like a little washout, yeah. like right at the base of the volcano. And it, like, if I wish you could see the video, it, like it, because it shows like that last cluster. And then this is like uh, all around it. Like there's a ton of them right there. Right there. there there's so many. Yeah, I think no, so I, I think I think Mind Spirit will get me the video. So when he comes on, I'll, I will make sure we get that video of of him coming up on this cluster. All right. Yeah. Uh, what do we got here? That's uh, that was them uh, about a week a week and a half into into their uh, into pinning. They started okay. pinning, and this is about a week, a week and a half, and because they take about. Uh, here, you know, another thing people should know about, uh, if they're, you know, wanting to, st you know, if they're considering starting to cultivate zaps is they, you have to have some patience. They take a long, you know, they're, they grow, they take a long time to colonize the substrate. And then once they do that, you have to case them and then you have to put them in your, you know, put them in your Martha or whatever, you know. And make sure that you're keeping, you know, the casing layers, you know, not like soaking wet, but I'm almost soaking wet, you know, like every day. And it well, it can take up to three months, you know, it can take up to three months oh, before wow. you get pins sometimes. Mine, mine took about a month and a half, which is pretty damn good. And uh, these were, took about a month and a half and then took about two weeks to fully mature once they started pinning. But yeah, that's them. That's them when they first started pinning, about a week into it. 
Okay. About a yeah, week and into again, it. Again, yeah. just look at those. Now but it's just interesting because you those beautiful block of stem. That's my favorite aspect is that uh -huh. stem right there. You know, I, I, I'm with you. I like the stem a lot. Now you know, compare these previous two. You know, they're they're in these these gullies, these mudslide areas. You know, yeah. maybe some volcanic ash mixed into that mud there somewhere. And then you got these pretty beautiful you know uh indoor cultivated they just look so clean and, and yeah so they really do they really <laughs> kind of they really kind of changed a little bit like yeah. not changed but like they i was kind of expecting more like a bigger yeah. a bigger more convex cap because that's one of the other aspects i love about them and i got a you know and i and i got a few uh fruits like that but you know most of my fruits at the beginning were like this and kind of had wavyish caps which, if you notice in that one cluster at the very beginning, it's got a fruit, got a really wavy, turned up cap, and oh, yeah, yeah, you know, right there, you can see, you can see in the front, and I think that yeah, might the caps be the are huge out in the wild. But but again, who knows when these are found? You know, they could be extremely mature. Um, yeah, so they could be going to work different. You know, it's a different sub. It's always going to be a little bit different yeah. indoors. It's always going to be a little bit different. Now, the one thing I'm noticing here, I'm going to pull up that first Alan Rockefeller picture um, is, you know, the you can actually see that that quality of the, the stipe a little bit more. And it's probably just because the environment is a little dirtier because you can see it's darker towards the base of the stipe. Yeah, they so, do that. They yeah. they'll do that indoors, too, though. Like, oh, uh, oh, okay. yeah, they will do that indoors. I think it has something to do with the potency. I'm not sure, oh, okay. but like I said, you like it, you know, I want to keep even like once they get to this stage, I still keep them super wet right under the fall rock, right under the, where the fog's coming it's down. Falling right. The fog. Falling and, right. Yeah. So the fog's just hitting them straight up and, uh, yeah, that, that's them a little bit more mature. And as you can see, the caps turned up and everything. Now that and, that uh, black discoloration is that the spores? Stick no, that's off? actually just it just blued like it that. It, it got a it got a little bit of too much. It got a little bit too much air, and then uh, the the Let's fog try. hit it after it got that a little bit of extra air, and uh, and it instantly just turned blue like that or bluish black like that. And I mean, these things will literally turn blue in the sunlight. I've seen, I mean, I've wow. seen pictures, I've seen photos of, of people that grew them and put, and they turned blue in the sunlight. They're, hmm. they're super sensitive. They're, you know, they're just, they're so, so they're, you know, they're real sensitive, but, no, but no, at the same time, but at the same time, they're super hardy. Like hmm. one, like they, once they start growing, like they're, you know, they're, as long as you keep their, keep them in the right environment, they're, you know, they're going to make it, you know, like they want to, they want to grow. Like they want to grow, they just have to be in the right environment. Now I'm and, noticing in this picture, in this picture, you know, uh, it, and even in this one, it says it's in the cloud forest. So they're not really getting direct sunlight. Is that correct? Like in their native habitats, they're probably uh, not yeah, they're probably not sunlight. getting. Uh, I mean, think about it, like at the base of a volcano in a cloud forest. Uh, you know, they're probably not getting a lot of direct sunlight, and so. Like I said, that's why I think that direct sunlight can cause can cause uh, can cause that. Right. Uh, I don't think that's what caused that. There, that's a really beautiful picture. That's one of my favorite pictures. I like this one. And then you, uh, so you're right. I see that uh, that that the darker brown coloration. But yeah, at the base of them, because of how much moisture you're having to keep, you know, because of how much moisture, the bottom of them will be kind of brown. Will be kind of have that dark discoloration like those wild ones you just you just put on the screen uh and uh i think i don't know what it has to do with that. i really think it has to do with the potency though because a lot of them a lot of them that, that i picked have had that same color discoloration and, and now uh, i know no one thing i'm noticing is let me go back here stipe in in the wild a little bit thicker Caps oh, yeah. definitely larger diameter, um, a lot more weight. Oh, the caps, caps are fat. Yeah, them caps yeah, are fat. So I'm thinking, you know, obviously that's an environmental factor. That's probably which they grow to the well. size. I, I believe a lot of mushrooms grow to the size of their environment, or like the you know what I mean, the size. Like 
I feel like if I would have used a bigger tub and had a you know thicker substrate, they would have they would have been bigger, is what I believe. But you know, I just used like a little you know small like dub tub top tub for it. So I think that might have had something to do with it. That makes. Total I think that might have had something to do with it. All right, I like this. Yeah, one. there's just some classic like the looking. Wild, those are some, yeah, those are some classic looking zaps with the cone looking, ca with the cone caps. And the, yeah, those look like wild ones. Those are, yeah, I love that picture. And then those are some that uh, Alan Rockefeller found. Those, yeah, those are definitely not mine. I wish I found those. <laughs> I would, I'd give my left leg or something. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, those are, that's a beautiful cluster. But that's a, you know, that's the typical, textbook zap to corn right there and you know, they do so when they're found them. they're typically found in a cluster is that right oh they're all yeah they love they right. they always found in a cluster like no i mean like they're rarely found uh growing solitarily yeah they're rarely found growing solitarily all right here i can kind of tell how wet you're you're keeping it in this picture yeah then that's a different tub that's a different tub of zaps it's the same culture as that last, as it's the same Popo Catapital culture, mm -hmm. but it's uh, it's in a, just in a different tub. This is a different tub of it. All right, look here, just some background information here. Um, but that picture is actually, is that subtraps? Yeah, that picture is actually uh, subtrops. Okay, my, my bad. I think I I, <laughs> no. I tried to grab that the Zapatorum description. Um, and then I grabbed the wrong one. So, so we'll we'll get back into that uh, a little bit later when we start talking about subtrap callus. Um, but anyway, those are cool photos, getting me excited. Uh, <laughs> hearing about the the fruiting times and all that, I'm like, okay, I got to strap in. I'm yeah, gonna, you got to strap my, in, man. My water it's bottle, a... man. I'm I'm going on a hike here. <laughs> yeah, you got it. Takes it, it, it's it's a it's a yeah. it's definitely a process. It's definitely a process. But if you I'm got ready. the but if you got the like me, like I, I'm obsessed with them. You know what I mean? Like I almost, I'm almost on a level of obsession with them. Of, you know, and they're such a because they're just so beautiful, and there's just something about them. Yeah. I don't know what it is, but it just captures my attention, and I believe it captures other people's yeah. attention too. And uh, they're well, definitely, and they're, they're definitely worth the wait. They're definitely worth the wait of how long they take to grow. Yeah. But um. It's, I'm excited uh, because now we're about... going to get, I want the specifics. I want to know what, what, what must you do? How does it differ from cubes? Most of our viewers here, right? They can grow cubes or, or they're yeah, learning how to are... grow cubes. So let's, okay, let's so that's through. what I was just about to get into yeah, is um, when you, uh, you know, you, I prefer, you know, Cubes, you know, a lot of people like to use rye grain or, you know, oats and stuff like that. Uh, I've found that like Milo or sorghum or millet, or, you know, okay. little grains like that work better with this. Okay. So, you know, when you're starting out on your grains, like a uh, small grain, small, yeah, like small grains, like I have, like a, okay. yeah, exactly. And then, okay. um, once you, you know, once it, and it'll take about, you know, three to four weeks, you know, for your zap jar to fully colonize. Like I said, they're, you know, they move slow. Right. And uh, once that, you know, once they get colonized, uh, uh, when it comes to the substrate, like I said, um, I just use cocoa core and vermiculite. And, uh, you know, that's what, you know, my spirit contact told me a long time ago. He said, uh, you ain't got to get all fancy. And add, you know, the sawdust and stuff like that. You know, that just, you know, it, like I said, you know, because it takes so long to fruit, you know, with all, you know, sawdust right. stuff in there, you're at way more of a risk for contamination. And uh, I've had that happen. I've, you know, I've started a few tubs before that had sawdust in them and they contaminated within like a couple of weeks. Right. So, like, I, I've, I've never ran, I've never worked with, a, I've never, uh, putting them to i'm never putting wood in the substrate again they work fine on cocoa core and vermiculite i believe the casing layer has a lot to do has a lot to do with it okay. uh, i have a special casing layer uh almost don't want to <laughs> give out the secret but uh oh, man, I will, we gotta uh, we all gotta grow some zaps dude oh uh, we will i'll Let's give out the secret this Trust is what me, i, so I mean, hard. Do you know how I do. people are gonna try this this is how I do my, my casing layer for the zaps. Okay, uh, so I use 
like Jiffy Mix Seed Starter. I'm sure everybody yeah. knows what that is. It's basically just peat moss and a little bit of vermiculite. I use right. a, I use about, uh, uh like a, a, half a, you know, like half the rate. If you're going by ratio, like a half of that, you know, like a half a cup of, you know, like. A, I, don't, I can't think of the measurements of what you know I'm you know using, but about half of the half of it I want to be that, mm-hmm. and then the and then about and then another quarter I want to be like super chunky vermiculite. I use big, super chunky big vermiculite. Big vermiculite, yeah. Yeah, the big thick vermiculite. I use that, and then like I said, I use about three quarters, or I use about two, uh, half uh, half a ratio of the uh, p- peat moss and or. The Jiffy Mix seed starter, and then I add the chunky about a quarter of the chunky vermiculite to it, okay. and then I add about a handful of sand, a hand, handful or a little bit of sand to the casing layer, and I believe that that makes a huge difference. I mean, I could be wrong, but you know, like down there, like you know, like uh, where you know that dirt down there that is growing out of is sandy. You know what right. I mean? Like if you look at pictures, there's certain pictures of like. I've seen a subtropicalis growing out of the ground and it just looks, the soil looks real sandy in certain places. And, you know, and it's around, you know, because they don't all go on volcanoes, you know, like I said, they, you know, landslides, ravines, places like that. And uh, I just think that, that, I think that that sand that I had, that I've added to it really uh, helps the, uh, helps the, um, helps speed up the fruiting process. I don't know. If and that that's all just that's I that could be wrong layer. that that's from yeah that's just the right, casing that's layer the casing layer so I it mean, takes about once you about once that. you spawn your jar to the substrate it's gonna take depending on your culture and how you know aggressive it is uh my culture soup you know my, my papo capital culture is super aggressive and it ate up my tub in about two weeks about two right. to three weeks and then uh as soon as it ate it up I cased it with about a quarter inch of that casing layer I was just explaining. And uh, once I cased it with that, I immediately put it in the tent, put it right under the fogger, mm-hmm. right under the fogger. And uh, and then I have like a, you know, a specific setup. I have a Jartha. I don't know if anybody knows what that is. Like, oh, yeah. a, you know, yeah. Jake Onsid is. Said, his yeah. type of Martha, the 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 his uh, the his Martha uh, setup. I I went mm-hmm. I went by his, and that's the setup I have. So uh, um, it's a little bit different. Uh, it's got the bottom of the Martha sealed, and then it has a filter on the back, and then it has an exhaust fan on the bottom, and then the fogger comes in on the top, and then so and then the fogger is hooked up to an ink bird timer. And that which is set at 94% humidity, and if it drops below 89, it, it pops back up, and so it, ke- it keeps it between 89 and 94% humidity at all times. You know, there's no sense in getting put in at 98% humidity because it, even in the wild, it's not going to get at 98% relative humidity. It'll get close, but like a 94% is just what I, I found worked great for me. I set my hygrometer, or I set my like my inkbird hygrometer at that, and connected it to you know for, to my fogger, and uh, you know set and um, like I said, that's not that wasn't on a timer. That was just that's just you know the way that hygrometer works is I set you know at ninety four, and then I set one at eighty nine. So it is uh, when it hits eighty nine, the fogger comes on. And it'll get once it gets it up to 94, it stops. And then once it drops back down again, it'll come back on. And then I have a, um, a cycle timer set at, for the exhaust fan at the bottom because the exhaust fan at the bottom pulls fresh air in through that filter in the back. You know, it pulls that fresh air in and pulls the carbon dioxide out of the bottom. And uh, it, that's set for. Um, uh, what did I have that set for? I think I had it set for four minutes to run for four minutes every uh, every three hours. Every three hours, I'd have to go look. It's either three hours or two hours, but uh, both of them work. But I've, I've you know I've worked with both uh, timings, and uh, 
didn't that didn't really make much of a difference. But uh, yeah, that's um, you know, that's just my setup and how you know and how I ran my operation. So if you're gonna grow these, you need a tent. Yeah, you need you a gotta tent. Have a way of cycling uh, an air exchange in there. You, you gotta yeah, have a way, you gotta have a way to cycle in a lot of humidity. I mean, yeah. people have done it. You know, and I mean, people do it in bags, and people do it in uh, in um, in tubs. I've seen it done in both. You know, if you uh, I don't know much about cultivating them in bags and tubs. So I've never done it. I'm sure I could do you, it. Yours are just in trays in the Jartha. Yeah, or I put them in like a one of those little uh, six quart, um, you know, like dub tub tubs. Yeah. Yep. And I put it in, uh, I spawn it in that, and then I just, yeah, I slide that on in the tent. Right so now, do you use the same ratio you do for cubes, like three to one, or? Uh, yeah, I use about, uh, I use, uh, like I said, I'm using that size, that size tub, so it's a pretty small tub. I use about, I use about a pint jar of, uh, of, um, spawn, of grain spawn mm -hmm. per one tub. And so I'm, and I'm how, probably how not, thick do you have that tub sitting? A couple inches? Substrate, or? I have the substrate sitting about four inches. Oh, you do? Four, okay. Three to four inches. And then, uh, I have, like I said, I have the uh, casing layer at quarter inch. Mm -hmm. You really don't want any thicker than that. And you really don't want it any thinner than that. Oh, so okay. your ratio is actually higher. That's, that's way more sub to spawn, I think. Because I, I usually do maybe like one one quart jar uh to three quarts um two to three quarts uh in most of my really six quarters like I'm, yeah, i always that. always spawn uh always do a pint jar to a to one of those six quart tubs okay. that's what i always have done since i've started um and whether it's cubes or zaps or subtrops or mexico whatever that's what i've all done and, uh, that word that same ratio works well with that you know that's the ratio i use with sub you know subs that's the ratio i've used with um cubes and it, it's the ratio i use with apps and it works great nice. you know, as long so, as you just got enough you know spawn in there to where you know it's not gonna give any contamination any time to take over or anything it's so like I said, it, well, it's like I said, there's no sense in growing it on a substrate with wood. And then, I mean, I, you can, and it could cause, you know, you, you to get bigger caps and bigger fruits. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not sure. I can't say for sure on that because I don't know yet. I'm, I'm still going to try it, you know, eventually, but I just haven't, you know, done it yet like that. But, uh, like I said, I can say for the cocoa corn vermiculite, as long as you got the right, uh, you know, temperature you want to keep. It's, oh, yeah, as far as temperature, I, like, I kept mine just around 70, you know, 70, uh, okay. yeah, around 70. I mean, I, I, it dropped to 65 sometimes and it got up to 75 sometimes and uh, it didn't really seem to bother it none. Awesome. Didn't really seem to bother. No, I, I think I don't think I would have wanted it to get any higher than seventy five though, and I don't think I would have wanted it to get any lower than sixty five. Like where you know, I tried to have a, I have a uh, what's it called a thermometer, an ink burst thermometer mm -hmm. set up too with some uh, what is it, some little fans, some little heaters right next to the tent to keep it you know right where it needs to be at. Yeah, that, that's cool, the man. main thing with that's the main thing with zaps is just is you got to really uh, micromanage and really control the environment. But once you understand it and once you get an understanding of it, it, it's it's really pretty it's really pretty simple. But I mean, you're saying you put those because I got the same thing. I, I got a little fogger and then I got it piped up to the top. So you're saying put those trays right under that fog right under them on the top okay. on the top uh, rack right underneath okay. that fog that's exactly what i do that's exactly what i do and it, it, it had no problem with it no problem at all and so you you so you i'm just in my head because i'm getting ready so i when i mix field capacity on my cv it's just like any other cube i just hit field capacity you're not mixing it a little wet or anything because it's going to be in a no a i'm time. keeping it about the same field capacity as a cube yeah and yeah, you know, you know, your, do what 
I see when, when you mix your casing layer, same, you're not adding water, right? You're, you're, you're mixing with the Jiffy mix. Oh, when I, when I make, when I mix my casing layer, yeah, I add the water, I mix everything together. I add the water, I get it to fill capacity okay, you do with and that. then I put it in, I put it in jars and then, uh, a st you can uh, look up the process on shroomery or whatever, but it's, a uh, uh, I pasteurize it in those jars and a, okay. in a, in a pot of boiling water. You know, I put like a little meat thermometer down in one of the jars and uh, and I pasteurize them. And that's a little kind of a lengthy process, but it, it's not, you know. It's, it is what it is. We do what we got to do. It is. It's not yeah. too bad. I learned that I learned that technique a long time ago from Sako Michael Gardner. Shout out. He, he's one of the homies. That's great. All right, so I think I'm ready, man. I I got two two quart jars going. Um, I got the tent ready. Uh, I think the I, I don't. Yeah, I got to get my uh, exhaust fan set up. But but I've you got yeah ready. seal the bottom of the tent yeah. off with like uh some kind you know like furniture plastic like the plastic right. you put over furniture if you're moving or something like right. take some of that and just seal the bottom of the tent with like duct tape with that and then cut a little hole in the back. Okay. And then add like some duct to it and then connect that to like a little fan and then have that fan set to a cycle timer. And I can point you to like after we're, after we get off here, I can just point you to the exact cycle timer that I use and everything. Perfect. Cool. Well, I, I mean, that's exciting. I mean, it's going to it sounds like, you know, it's a slower process. It's more like an Enigma timeline or something like that. But yeah, okay. it is definitely I'm, slower. I'm ready. Well, yeah, yeah, I feel like you are. I feel like you're ready. Like, man, it's, it's a, uh, I feel like you know when you're ready. Like, I knew when I, my first zap girl, like, I just knew that it was going to be, like, I knew that it was going to be successful. And, uh, like, uh, a lot of people don't even know this. Like, my first zap girl, like, a quarter of the tub contaminated. I had to cut a quarter of the tub out. You know, and I still, and it's still, you know what I mean? I was not giving up on them. You know, I almost did. I seen a little bit of contamination. I was about to throw it out. And then like, like two so days hard. later after I was about to throw it out, I looked and seen some pins. I was like, oh, hell no. I, can. I yeah. cut that contam out. And it, it did its thing for like literally like eight months. It flushed for like eight months. I'm not even okay. playing. Now I'm excited. Like it just stopped flushing like a That's couple, great. like a month ago. Like these ones I just showed, uh, I just showed on here were like one, like a couple of the last fruits. That's awesome. That's looking amazing. Yeah. All right, man. Well, uh, so I think we did zaps. This is uh, it's a good start. I mean, I, I'm I'm gonna also like uh, I mentioned earlier, we're gonna have Mind Spirit Contact, who's Scylla Vibes' uh, original mentor. He's also, uh, you know, he's right down there in that region, so he he's got a, a nice connection to to the local yeah, history really of connected to the environment and everything down yeah. there yeah. yeah so that'll be cool all right so let's yeah. move on you you also can uh kill a subtropicalis grow so let's get a little bit into some subtropicalis um, yeah subtropicalis um honestly I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, do yeah I'm gonna I'll, I'll so people got something to look at while we're talking <laughs> already yeah this was my actual first subtropicalis grow too and a uh, shout out to Stab McDab and that's who I got uh, the multi-sport culture from. And I worked it from that. I don't really know where it's uh, from. I wish I knew the origin of this culture, but I don't, but yeah, they're super, I mean, they blew my mind. I, they're, they're some of the most beautiful subtrops I've ever seen. And uh, they grew, uh, they took about, you know, subtrops are kind of, they're kind of like, they're a lot like zaps. They're actually like, you know, if you HPLC and like a DNA, you know, D sequence mm -hmm. the DNA of them, they're really closely related. Zapatocorum and uh, um, subtropicalis are. And you can tell by, you know, the flocko stem, yeah. they, they have a similar, you know, look to them kind of, you know, especially in the wild, especially in the wild, some, you know, subtrops look a lot like zaps. And, uh, Normally, though, indoors subtrops always look like the, you know, they are, they a lot of times they have this kind of yellow peanut mm -hmm. butter cap and they, you know, like to turn up. Eventually, they like to, you know, get wavy. And, uh, you know, once they get wavy, they start to produce spore. It's really hard to get spore from, you know, species like these for some reason indoors. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, 
got a little, I think, uh, a couple of them that spored, but uh, not very many. Um, but yeah, they were, this was, uh, they were one of my favorite species um, by far. Man, look at species. that canopy, dude. Yeah, like that cat walk on walk over. Right. <laughs> no doubt. That's that's uh, that's probably like one of my like one of my most imp- to me that. that's my most impressive exotic canopy I've ever had. Like good you know, I love and I have I had some good zap canopies and stuff, but I didn't have you know, like I've the way all of them just you know are set right all the caps set right next to each other, like that's wow. like a like you said, it looks like you could walk on it, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Exactly. Uh, yeah, they're, this was a beautiful grow. It was, a, I mean, it was a, my first sub, my first sub chop grow too. And, uh, the substrate I used for this was a little bit different than the zap substrate. Mm-hmm. I used, uh, I don't know if you know what fung straight is. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. Uh, I used the great, great sub substrate supplier. Oh, yeah, so great did you use, so is this, this has got some manure in it. Yeah. It's got a little bit. It's got like, a. About twenty percent fung straight, and then the rest of it, or twenty five percent fung straight, and then the rest of it is just cocoa core and vermiculite, the same way that zaps, the same way I do my zaps. Nice. And then uh, I do these in like a tray, and the, uh, I have the substrate a little thinner. Like the substrate for these was about like two inches, and then the casing layer was the same recipe that I used for my zap casing layer, and. Uh, and uh, I keep it about the same the same uh, depth, about a quarter of an inch. Okay. So, so you grow these like the zaps? They also like the same humidity. Yeah, they like to be they like to be right under the fog. Right they lo- the they fog love that moisture. That they okay. love it. Uh, I mean, it makes yeah. sense, right? They're from the same region. Yeah, they're from the exact same region. It I mean, you sense. find them they, in they a lot of the, like same the same places. Yeah. They're from the same region, and uh, so yeah. They like the same kind of, you know, they like the same kind of thing. That one I love because it looks like so much like a wild, so much like a wild specimen, oh, yeah. you know. And then they, you know, it has that convex cap. It almost looks like a zap kind of a little bit. And Yeah, you, the, you know, the cap has definitely got that more wild. Uh, yeah, definitely. Out which, which if you think about it, if if uh, if you're in a cloud forest, right, and, and the, the, the cap's, you know, fanning out, you might have dew resting on it. There might be some rain, and it kind of gets pummeled a little bit. Oh I yeah, mean, maybe that thing wanted to be flat, but you know, just the the elements. <laughs> might have been like it, it was. I know it got plenty of moisture, and I, the, I think that's the one I ate on Christmas Eve, and it's just that one, and it was that way like point ten point twenty, I think. And I went to the moon, buddy. I went to the moon. I wasn't expecting that. I was just having trying to have like a little mini trip on Christmas Eve with my babe. You know what I mean? And like, dude, I ended up going to Mars. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it was wild. It was a beautiful experience. I, I love subtrops. They're they're just they're like my second favorite compared as far as the effects, as far as the. Uh, you know, mental effects. They're uh, like my second favorite, you know, compared All right, to so the, the only, so uh, if you're keeping up on the tech and you got the, the zap decorum tech down, the, the change for the sub traps is, is like a quarter of the recipe for your sub is going to be a manure based substrate. And, yep. uh, and other than that, treat them like zaps. Your, your case. Right. Yeah, exactly. Or, and you can just use cocoa corn vermiculite for the mm-hmm. substrate with those. I just find I like to use a little bit of manure with it. I think that helps a lot. I do. I really do. Because I did a I did a tray without the uh, without any fung straight, and it did not do as well. So that tells you right there. You All know, right, man. Well, you, you sent me some other pictures, and, and you've mentioned some of these mushrooms. So let let's pull them up and talk about them a little bit. Oh, no. right. What do we got right here? Oh, uh, that's not mine. I didn't find okay. that. That's a, that was found by Evil Shroom uh, or Evelly Shroom. I don't know if you know who that is, but uh, shout out. He's one of my homies. He lives down in the ATL. He actually sent me some uh, a couple of uh, print. I don't know. They weren't from. I don't know if they were from these K Rue lessons, but they were from a pair of K Rue lessons like this down in uh, Atlanta and that he sent me that I'm working on right now. And I'm super excited about them. They have like the bluish caps. Oh, and I'm really, really excited about them. 
you know, because K Rue lessons in the United States, you know, like, you know, down in Mexico, you know, like they, you know, they grow on landslides. They also grow in like sugarcane pulp and uh, coffee plantations, stuff like that. But here in the United States, they favor completely different conditions. Well, they still like, you know, red clay and stuff like that, but mm -hmm. they really favor uh pine needles lob lolly pine needles like there's a it's a certain kind of pine tree that grows down here in the south it's like got the real tall and that got any lower branches and uh they they love the they love to grow in those in the, those pine needles and um for some reason they love atlanta and northern georgia area they've also been found in the alabama they've also you know they've been found a lot man. of southern states me and alan soil. rockefeller me and Alan Rockefeller have had a couple conversations, and we both believe that they grow in Arkansas. They just haven't okay. found it because there's nobody out looking. But I'm, I'm out looking. I'm, I'll be out looking when the time is right this year, okay. because I mean, all we have are loblolly pines, red clay, and uh, and um, sweet gums, and that's what they love here in the states for some reason. They love the and Bermuda grass and fescue grass for some reason, and. Uh, they just have a really diverse ecology. But yeah, they're one of my. Uh, oh, you go? And um, I've never tried them. I, I really want, I can't wait to. You know, I can't, uh, I hope, I don't know if I, I'll get to find one in the wild and try one like that first, or if I'll get to cultivate one and try one first. But uh, I, I think, I mean, the cultivation process, I don't, I ain't, start, I ain't started them yet, but I imagine it's a lot like that process. You know, I'll, I'll talk to my spirit about it and everything and get some, get a little bit of knowledge and a little bit of it, you know. Yeah. Now, these were of, also used by Aztecs and, uh, Mexico. oh, yeah. They, yeah, the Aztec, the K Ru lessons, Zappa de Corm, uh, Mexicana, yeah. uh, Subtropicalis, all those were used by, um, this Neos Alapenses, all those were used by you know the Aztecs, the Zapotecos, and the uh, and um, the Mazatecs. And like I said, you know the Zapotecorn was named after the Zapotecos. So, all right. All right. What was this saying? Oh yeah. Okay. See, you you already covered this. Oh, you just said the same thing. All right. And then this this I I mined from your Instagram. I just thought this was a a cool little old photo. Yeah, that's like an old school like a. Uh, Oh, pictures great. of like different mushrooms from down there in in the uh down there in Mexico. Yeah, that's cool. So I'm seeing here the Salasabi uh K Relescence and then it says variety Mazatecorum. Uh I don't know if I've ever heard any mention of the variety. I've heard of that before, but I think now it's just K Relescence. Just K -relescence, uh, K -relescence yeah. yeah, pretty yeah. sure. I'm pretty sure. I, I like that slide. I I, I just put it in because I thought it was cool. Oh, uh, and then it. here's your original drawing, right? This yes, is from sir. now. So this is supposed to be K relescence or is what? what no, it's got a lot of different. It's got a lot of different things in it. You got to okay. really look closely. I mean, if, so you look closely, you can Locked see those thread. cubes. You can yeah. see those cubes in the front. You know, like, you know, you see those cubes. Yep. You see that penis envy right there, mm -hmm. and then over here you can see a few pan cyans. Right. And then over here on the right, you can see that K Ru lessons, and then down below that, you can see a couple Mexicana. I see them. Man. And then uh, down below that, down there, you can see some wood lovers. You see some wavy caps, some slow to be signed essence. Nice. Yeah, man. And then you cool. can actually see the manure, you know, where the you know the um, cubes and pans are growing out of, and then you can see the the mulch where the uh, cyan essence are growing from. Very cool, man. You got it. You definitely got to get that vectorized, like send it to somebody who can turn it into a vector drawing and uh, yeah, yeah, I want to so bad. Sure, all that stuff. That'd be a very cool uh, graphic to be able to. Yeah, especially, the, you know, drawing it myself. I mean, I, I love drawing uh, and that. It, uh, I spend a lot of time on that, a lot, a lot of time with the shading and stuff and getting it just right. It's good. But, yeah. Yeah. I, like I appreciate it. it, man. I really do. Those yeah, are some uh, pan paps that I found. They're non-active pan They're a non-active pan species. Okay. They're, they're real. Uh, they're they're everywhere out in this field that I go. This uh, the field that I go to that I find a lot of my cubes. I find most of my cubes in. 
Mm-hmm. There's, a, there's a lot of these out there. Pan Pap. Pan, yeah, and uh, pan they're pan, they're pan. they're pretty much everywhere, right? Yeah, they're tricky. They're they're like tricky. Like uh, when you get out when you go out to pastures, mm-hmm. you'll see pan pap, pan antelarums everywhere, and they will trick you and make you think they're a pan cyan every time. And <laughs> it is very frustrating, and, dog. <laughs> Let me tell you. Like after you come up on about five clusters and none of them blue, you're like, I ain't even picking up another one of these. <laughs> That's that's uh, good to see. Uh, oh, there's some beautiful Karu lessons found yeah. by uh, Evely Shroom right there. Beautiful textbook Karu lessons. The, those are the Atlanta ones, and for some reason, the ones in the states have these blue caps. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think I hope I think that I mean it could possibly be the cluster that my prints came from. I hope so because I love to see those indoors. Yeah, man, those that, would, that would be something to see <laughs> well, i'm waiting for you to succeed and then then we'll have you back on and then we can talk about uh y- y- how that grow went and all that stuff no doubt well like i said i got them going on agar right now i'm just working on cleaning them up you know because they're you know i'm working from wild spore and it takes a little time to get them cleaned up and you know okay. get them completely yeah. clean and then that and then that's when it's time to isolate yeah, man. I, uh, so when I ordered a bunch of stuff from Jordan, um, it was honestly, I think maybe I had gotten a Texas orange cap one time from somebody that, that was wild found, but I, I really had mostly not worked with much wild found prints. And I was like, Oh, I'm going to have to do some work on these. I got to clean these up a little bit. These come from the wild. And, uh, yeah. so the wild's got all the wild's got, yeah, you got, there's a little bit of, because I mean, there's yeah. bacteria out there. Yeah. There's, you know, like a little bit of, you never, you know, it's all types of shit, you know, but I mean, so, you know, most prints are, you know, not too dirty. I'm, yeah, you know, I've never, I've never had a wild out. print that was just too dirty that I couldn't even work it. You know what I mean? I've never had that happen. So not yet. All right, so wrong. what do we got here? Are these more of those, uh, paps? Yeah, these are, uh, um, these are either paps or, um, what's the other name? Uh, I can't think of the olive oak, olive or something like that. I think, but they're not another non-active. kind of pan. They're another pan, but they're another non-active pan. There is that the this field that I go to is full of non-active pans. Olivaceous. Yeah, olivaceous. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I think that's the one. And this those are the most favorite lessons. Caps opening up, dude. Yeah, man, Evely Shroom, man, he is, he's got a gift, like, he's got a gift for uh, finding these, finding these beautiful oh, Taylor lessons and, and, he, and getting these beautiful got, shots. Yeah, he's got some honey pots, that's for sure, man, look at those. Like, he's got some spots, and he, and he's, te- he's taught me a lot, too, like, you know, he, and he believes they grow in Arkansas as well, I mean, we have, we have the same environment, you know, I mean, it ain't much different in Atlanta down there you know, as far as like ecology and stuff. So I'm looking, you know, I'm out looking for these. I'm out looking for these and ovoids because I believe ovoids could possibly grow here too. Uh, you know, I'm not sure, but you know. Or you just mix work. up a lot of liquid culture and grab a lot of prints and get a lot. Oh yeah, of, I'm about know, to do that. I got some spots. I'm about to just, just go spray down. I got to scrape right. some prints off in some water bottles and just yeah. pop some holes in those water bottles yeah. and just spray them in some clear cuts and stuff. Let's see so, what and, happens. Yeah, I mean, I'm yeah. definitely do, about to do that here pretty soon. Yeah, I mean, that's more of the maybe paps or the elevaceous. Okay. All right, man. Uh, yeah. That uh, yeah. You're getting me excited. Um, my, I definitely my, hope that one of these days we can get down to, uh, uh, you know, the Oaxaca mountains or one of these mountains that got some. We sapphire. will, man. We definitely yeah, will. And, uh, my favorite pictures, uh, from out, from the outdoors that I found are like my cubes, you know, my, uh, my land race strains. Yeah. Like those are, those I do are not really... have any of those pics prepped. I'll, I'll have, uh, we'll just have you on again. We'll talk about, uh, we'll talk right, about some, right. some cubes, uh, another time. Um, no because I, I, I think right now in the cube community, there's, you know, we've, we've bottlenecked a lot of the genetics and we've so come people aren't interested in land race and yeah, stuff so like now that. People are re-interested in how do we reinvigorate some of these, you know, crossing some well-known things, uh, you know, yeah, like me and, 
Yeah. Like I'm trying to get like my, like me and Basidi and Equilibrium have been talking about, you know, maybe eventually one day getting, you know, a, a slot for me to, uh, you know, uh, get rid of my land race, you know, yeah. strain through him, you know, through his website and stuff like the yeah. Oxark or the Wizard's Hat or the Golden River or the Goldilocks, you know, I have quite a few of them. I have yeah. about five of them all together that, uh, I found them right here in Ozark, Arkansas, and uh, they're all, you know, beautiful. Some of them are wild clones, work from wild clones, and then others are work from wild prints. So, yeah. So I'll have you on again. Well, you got more to talk about, right? To today, this was all the the, the zaps and the exotics and all that stuff, and and we'll no doubt, man. Yeah. Yep. I got, dude, I got, I can talk forever <laughs> when it comes to my well, college. It's <laughs> obvious. It's obvious you love them. It's obvious you, you, you research them, take them seriously. And, uh, uh again, I think when, when we and it's obvious, back, I want to share them with people. Yeah. I mean, like, I want to share this information. I want to share this love because I want everybody that wants to experience this to be able to experience this, you know, exactly. Like I said, the main key though, is you got to have that patience. Right. You can't give up on them because they will test your patience. You know, uh, well, I got three kids, so my patients are. T- <laughs> you should be good, day, man. <laughs> you should have no trouble. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 the the patients, I'll be okay. I, I think we'll. Be yeah, you should be good. <laughs> there, yeah, you should no be way they're gonna test my patients more than my kids. Oh my uh, you should be straight, hundred <laughs> percent. Cool, man. Well, uh, thanks for being on. We'll have you on again, and uh, I, I'm really. Yeah, I enjoyed it, brother. I enjoyed yeah. it. Thanks for having me on. Oh yeah, man. No problem. And uh, you know. Man, in the back of my head, I'm just like one of these days. Uh, we're gonna get down to Mexico. We're gonna hang out with Mind Spirit. We're we're, we're oh gonna, yeah, we're, we're going get, to man. We got to do yeah. it. We got to find some of these, and then we're gonna have an on location podcast. We're gonna talk about that. It. Would be lit. That would that be would be a dream yes. come true. Yeah, literally, yeah, <laughs> and more importantly, be. so I want to send a message out to everybody uh, who's watching. So you know the the reference, the the seriousness, the um, like uh, Sillivibe said, like he he felt like obligated when he got these prints to work them, these rare prints, right? These these rare spores. Um, succeeding in in cultivating some of these rare species then allows other people to obtain prints and 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 work that and uh, all that stuff is uh, that's just part of the, this growing population of people that love uh, psilocybin containing mushrooms and love the medicinal benefits of them. Um, so yeah, I, I I really really commend you for taking it seriously. Uh, you got me into it, so you've already inspired me, and hopefully already uh, man that makes hey that makes that makes my heart feel good, man. I appreciate good, man. that. Yeah. Appreciate that. That's why I do it, man. I, I do it. It's all about the love, man. It's all about the love. It's all about the fun guy, bro. It it's is. all about you know at the end of the day having that connection. I mean, it's, this fun guy's changed my life. I'm sure it's changed your life. Oh yeah. And I mean, everybody listening, I'm sure it's changed their lives, you know, and like, and there's just something about the, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, you know, if you get, you know, because like once you've grown cubes for so long, not that they get boring, it's just that like, yeah, you, but know, you, you, you might want to, you know, you feel like you want to try your hand with something else, you know, you feel like you want to, you know, st- you know, step it up, you know. You know, subtrops are a little easier. You know, I might start with subtrops right. first and then go to zaps. You know, that's what I did. You know, I did subtrops. You know, I did, I actually did, you know, pans and I wasn't very successful with them. I had a few pop up and that was like two years ago. And then I did, uh, I fruited some ATL sevens that were uh, Tampanenses that were amazing. Man. They were textbook ATL sevens. And then uh, uh, fruited some of those. Uh, also fruited just some regular tamponenses. And then uh, and it came the subtrops. And then after the subtrops came the zaps. And, then, and the rest so. is history. All right, man. Well, thank you for being on. Like I said, we'll have you on again. And we'll talk about the ox arc and, and some of the, the local uh, cubes that, that you're working on. Um, it'll be uh, another fun episode. Uh, until then, I wish you well, and uh, thanks for being on. No doubt, man. Much love, everybody. All right. Take care, brother. All right, guys. So there he is, 
still a vibe. Uh, great guy, uh, really cool, knows a lot about his area. We'll, you know, we'll have him back on to talk about uh, some of his uh, uh, local land races he's developed. Uh, but I, I think that was a pretty good overview of uh, Zaps and Subtrops and, um, you know, even little Cave Relescence uh, action there at the end. Uh, definitely got me excited about growing Zaps. Uh, can't wait. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I'm ready. I'm ready to do it. I uh, hope I inspired some other people out there to maybe give them a go. You know, if if you feel like you got the cubes locked down, maybe you've grown some tamps, give it a try. What do you got to lose? Nothing. You just, a tub? You've already lost that. It's all good. All right. Uh, so before we move on, man, if you're if you're still here, if you're enjoying the content, you know, click the like. Just click it. Touch it. Click it. Smash it. I don't care. Um. I love my subscribers. If you're not subscribed, subscribe, add the little notification. Every time a new episode comes out, you'll get the notification. Uh, definitely helps traction on YouTube. Uh, I definitely appreciate that. And uh, quick, uh, again, shout out to Patreon. If you love what I'm doing here and you want me to keep doing it, uh, consider supporting me on Patreon. It's just patreon.com backslash Michael Geeky. Um, pretty easy. Now I will say, uh, because it is uh, adult content, it's considered, you know, not safe for, for children content. Um, if you are within the Patreon app on your phone, um, you can't just search my name. It, you have to basically go to Google, Google Patreon, Michael geeky, and then click that link. And, and then it'll say, do you want to open it up in, in the app? It's, it's a weird workaround. It's got something to do with, they don't want kids to be able to search for, Content they shouldn't be able to search for, basically. So let's keep the kids safe. Anyway, all right. So here we go. Moving on. Uh, next guest. Um, he's uh, he's just a absolutely reputable vendor. Um, I've known him for a good little while, and he happens to live uh, across town from me. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome to the show Jeff Karras of Fungus Frequency. What's up, brother? What's up? How's it going? How you thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for being here. Now, uh, you know, I, I think maybe just a handful of people know this, but but I'll, I'll tell the audience here. Um, I don't have a lot of Myco neighbors. Um, you know, like like most of you guys out there, you know, we we really do feel like an island amongst ourselves, growing our cubes in the basement. Uh, you know, a lot of times the wife doesn't want to talk about it. Most friends don't want to talk about it. Uh, and I, I'm very lucky. I, I found a few people locally here in Northeast Ohio, uh, one of them being Jeff. So, um, you know, Jeff and I, we've, we've met each other and, and chit chatted and hopefully get to uh, hang out a little bit more in the future. So, uh, you know, just for full disclosure. Um, yeah. So anyway, uh, but it's really cool having somebody I've actually met on the show it actually feels a little weird for me. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Um, it's like, oh, I know you. It's got a different feel. <clears throat> anyway. Definitely. All right, man. So uh, we had you on uh, earlier when we were um, talking about the birth of uh, Aptar uh, during a be Behind the uh, Veil segment. Um, and uh, so, you know, people maybe first got exposed to you on that episode. But now we're going to get, you know, we're going to get the bigger picture about you as a cultivator. Uh and so, like I always do, let's start out with that uh, Myco origin story, like your earliest memory of going, oh, mushrooms are cool, and, and then ultimately how how you became a cultivator, that kind of that whole story. Definitely, yeah. Um, I mean, probably similar to a lot of people, you know, teenage years, uh, had a, a, a couple of times where it just kind of came up, and it was like, you know, at that point, obviously, teenager willing to try different things and stuff, and I remember just from the the first couple times uh, trying them, it was like this is something different to me. Like you know, I I tried drinking, I tried smoking, you know, and it it was that was whatever. But I always felt like I had like some some really great insight into things that I didn't even know I was looking for necessarily. Um, you know, after you know having some mushrooms, and they weren't around often, but when they were, it was like okay, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, and then. Uh, you know, later, you know, fast forward to later teen years and all that, uh, kind of got away from that stuff for quite some time. Um, and just like many other people in this uh, community kind of fell into, uh, an addiction for a while with drinking. And, um, then, 
you know, so that took up a good chunk for a while and, you know, kind of just, I don't know why it just kind of didn't come up with the mushrooms and, and different things. And so, you know, fast forward even years later, then, you know, got, uh, got sobered up from the drinking and that, and just, you know, completely chilled out on everything. And then it just so happened, that, uh, you know, started doing some research and reading about it. Of course, like a lot of people I'd gotten into, um, you know, taking some psychology classes and, uh, my plan was actually to delve into some neuroscience type studies, uh, at college and everything. I was going back and taking some classes and, but, uh, then, um, I don't know, a couple of years before, uh, the whole COVID thing and all that and, uh, everything, I actually got exposed one time to DMT and had one experience with that. And because at the time I was interested in the mushrooms, but, you know, had a young kid and was like, I don't necessarily have four to six hours to <laughs> designate and, uh, you know, do that. And someone, it just so happened, it came around and was like, you know, I had done a slight bit of reading, but honestly was not real familiar with it at the time and just knew this is quick kind of in and out type thing. Had an experience and at the time saw lots of cool stuff, didn't really understand even what I saw. And within weeks, I noticed a change in myself. Like I just had the urges to take care of myself better, eat healthier, um, get some exercise, you know, um, so, something, something changed there. And for me, it just opened up that that was like the whole Pandora's box. And I was like, okay, there is something here. I had already kind of ventured into the, the learning about the brain and all that stuff. So then that experience and everything i was like okay you know i really delved into just researching all of it and um then fast forward a little further you know had um started learning about the mushrooms especially when it came to microdosing and my wife actually was dealing with some antidepressants that she was trying to wean off of and wanted to get off of at the time and really found a lot of good stuff about helping the, the microdosing helping with that so at that point, I was able to get some mushrooms and she started trying them and it was helping a lot. And after a little bit of that, I kind of had the epiphany also of, well, what if I can't get these? Um, <laughs> I should probably, you know, I kind of got her going with this. Uh, we, we need to make sure this can be uh, upheld and everything. So just really started researching the growing. And uh, for me, honestly, it took a while. It, it took a while for me to even get a first successful grow. Um, I uh, I had someone who kind of jumped to me and said, "Hey, I'll be your mentor. I'll teach you some stuff." Um, he's honestly someone who I haven't even seen in the actual community or anything in quite some time now. Um, but uh, he also had some of his own issues going on. So a lot of the time when I would get to a pivotal point of, "Hey, what do I do?" I'd have a few days to maybe a week where I couldn't get in touch with him. So I'd start kind of just winging it and doing things, and that way I did find out you know, along the way, things that worked and things that didn't, even though everyone else probably knew most of those things didn't work, but I figured it out the hard way. <laughs> um, so I had probably a good four or five months of, you know, fails with grains or fails with sub or, you know, or one thing or another before um, actually getting a first successful grow. And um, at that point, I, I was, you know, completely enthralled in it and the research of it and everything. And so then once that first grow happened after that much work, and I mean, I threw out probably more tubs than anyone would care to admit, <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, so at that point it was, it was all that more rewarding though, you know, after all those failed attempts and everything and, and maybe not failed attempts, but learning attempts, you know, whatever. And, uh, at that point I just, I was off and running and just, you know, was trying to take in anything and everything and information and videos and, um, and along the way, you know, just learning, uh, uh, just so much about life from the, the mushrooms themselves. And, you know, of course, as you're getting into different cultigens and trying different ones and, you know, you have to kind of see what the feel is of each and, and, you know, kind of see what they're about. And, you know, to me, it's it's a highly medicinal thing. It's, you know, I think um, it's already being shown in, in so much, you know, different studies and stuff like that. But I think it's just the, the snowball effect is just beginning, in my opinion. Oh, and hundred, it, hundred, it, hundred. <laughs> so, uh, you know, as far as being able to help people, you got to be familiar with the stuff you're going to help people with. So 
I've, you know, of course done that. And then also, you know, got into some of the different, uh, courses and stuff online with different places doing uh, integration therapy and stuff like that, just to see what different ones are about and what different techniques are. And, and just everyone, every, I try to take in everyone's thoughts and ideas on stuff because it, it, it really does seem to me like there's really not a wrong way because no matter what we think is wrong, it, it probably works for someone, you know, so to, to have all the, the tools is better than having less of the tools. And, you know, so to me, that's, I guess that's kind of what's gotten me where I am now and, you know, just still excited about all of it and, and just seeing where all this stuff keeps going. Well, you're not the only person who suffers from, uh, you know, that, that learning curve in the beginning of, of really going, holy cow, this is, uh, yeah, I, I had a bit of that. Uh, and it, it did just like you, it took finding a mentor who was like, okay, so all these people, they just want to make money on you. They love it when all your stuff contaminates and you got to buy more stuff from them. But I'm not trying to sell you anything and, and I'm going to help you grow. And, and then that's when my, that narrative for me completely changed. So yeah, I, 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 man, shout outs to all the mentors, all the people that, that take an hour out of their day, uh, you know, here and there to, to help new growers grow. They, they're really the people that, that keep, keep the cultivation community alive. Otherwise, uh, otherwise the trolls would just have people just exiting, you know, on mass. It would, it would be, it, it would not be good. So, For uh, sure. so that's and, cool. You know, I, I think a reoccurring theme that we're, we get a lot on here. This is kind of why I got into it. It's this motivation to go. So I have an issue or my loved one has an issue. Uh, Western medicine so far has really not solved that problem. Or maybe it helps a little bit, but then it causes 19 other problems. And ultimately, I'm not satisfied with the interventions that Western medicine has provided me. But I read an article or someone yeah. talked to me about something. And, uh, and then it just it, it starts you down that path. So, yeah, uh, whether it's, you know, that, that quick, you know, eight to, eight, to, 8 to 15 minute blast off on some DMT and have you go, oh, wow, that 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 was a nice little reset button on my brain that, that did something there. Right. Um, right. Or, or just reading an article. I just, one day at work, I had some downtime. I'm just like farting around on the internet and happened just to get fed something about uh, psilocybin used for, uh, you know, some microdosing thing as well. Uh, but whatever it is, something has you go, Oh, maybe I should give this a try. So, yeah, I think, I, I think, this story we're going to keep hearing over and over again is how people get into it. Um, but it's also interesting to hear you say that then once you're into it, right, the, even the cultivation practice, not just the medicine, but the cultivation practice teaches you so many things of patience and persistence and uh, also learning and listening to people, observing what's going on, right? Like it's, it's a great hobby to help you reflect on your your journey through life i think that's that's been my experience i, I think i'm hearing you say the same thing for so, sure all right and before, real quick before we get too far off the mentor topic uh i just wanted to mention you know that Sci team united big shout out to him because uh oh, yeah. he was definitely the one that right around that time when i was getting my first grow like he was you know right there helping me along the way and you know was always someone that i could get a hold of and you know so like you said it just takes that one good person and you know and just wanted to give a shout out to him because that, that definitely is appreciated and that's the same reason that i try to make sure that when i have you know i have a, a ton of people that reach out to me and i feel like to me if they did take the time to reach out to me like that's my cue that this is someone to help so you know, I, I try and help anyone that I can along the way. So, uh, oh, shout out to Kyle, Psy Team United. He, um, <clears throat> he, he was, uh, as I mentioned before, he was on the Behind the Veil for uh, SV10, and we talked about a few other things. And uh, we also got into a little bit about the process of how Aptar came, came about, which we can get into a little bit later, because it looks like we, we got an Aptar cross uh, we're going to talk about a little bit later. Um, but yeah, I also want to just reiterate how that mentor relationship not only helps people get growing, but then that can also evolve into like a myco friendship or like a myco uh, partnership where you can start, uh, you know, projects. And I, I'm a big advocate. I'm going to keep talking about this quite a bit here in the next probably year or two 
of uh, finding a, a group of people. Now, this isn't a tribe or a gang that, that can like muscle around and bully other people. That's not what I'm saying. But a group of people that maybe share a similar agenda, they want to work some genetics together, um, you, you know, just sort of a, a bonded group of people that can help one another out. I, I think that goes uh, goes a long way in this community for sure. So, you know, you got that with Kyle. Um, and, and I also want to say uh, in my Discord, so uh, I get to pay attention to who, who's helping people out and who's just lurking. And uh, Jeff's always there answering questions, helping people out. I think that's one of the things that makes him such a great vendor. Um, and that's also been a, a trait I've, I've highlighted time and time again. The quality vendors will, will take time. Now, maybe there are a few vendors, I'm not going to name names, but they're so big, they're so busy, they do their best, but it's definitely hard to uh, always reach out to people or get back to people in a timely fashion. That's okay. We understand that's like the, you know, the downside to success is just being too busy, I guess. Uh, but but people <laughs> like Jeff or um, uh, yeah, anyway. So yeah, people like you are are, are definitely uh, an important. Uh, it's important to have a lot of people like you in the community. So uh, love to have people like you on and 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 celebrate what you do. So anyway, okay. So let, <laughs> let's move on. Let let's talk about. So we've talked a little bit about uh, kind of how you got into all this. <laughs> Um, let's talk about, and I mean, I've seen your grow space, so I already know, but not everybody does. Um, and, uh, so let's talk about, uh, you know, what techs you use, um, your process a little bit. Um, because I, I can tell you right now, I recommend a, a good handful of vendors to a lot of people. And over the last little over a year and a half, I have, you know, there's some people I used to recommend. I don't recommend anymore. And I'm at a point now where the criteria I use for somebody to be the first person I mention to somebody when they say they're looking for genetics, it's consistency, it's track record, it's a very low contamination rate, meaning I almost never hear stories about uh, this, this person vending contaminated plates. Um, and I can, and then have maintaining a library. It's, it's really hard to maintain a large library of uh, genetics. I, I'm going to tell you right now, I think you are uh, one of the strong players because you <sighs> knock all that out of the park. Um, I have heard nobody say they've gotten a contaminated plate from you. I'm, I'm sure it's happened, but I imagine you just swap it out and fix the problem real fast. Uh, and then no one's got a reason to complain about it. Um, you got a big library. You have a wide variety of, of cultigens in your library. Um, so I think it's important. Let's talk a little bit about the text you use and what you think contributes to uh, that consistency and, and that kind of success. Yeah, so um, definitely lots of organization um, as far as like maintaining all that. And uh, oddly, kind of like a couple other people have talked about too, coming from a, a history and a background working in restaurant management and all of that, you know, um, dates and things like that are very crucial when you're dealing with food, just as when you're dealing with, you know, uh, mycology stuff, because you need to know how old things are and pay attention to, oh, you know, maybe I should get some new transfers from this, or maybe I need to run this again. It's been a couple months or, you know, whatever it may be. And uh, I like to run a, a lot of cultigens just because I I love them all. I mean, it's just, I, I, I find such a beauty in all the varieties and everything. And so I enjoy doing so many different ones. And so for me, that's, that's kind of part of it too. Um, but yeah, definitely, um, maintaining the whole library and stuff. And, um, it's, it's just a lot of organization. And as far as, uh, the different texts and stuff I use, um, I had been using, I actually just switched to popcorn, um, for, uh, in the, in the past month or so. And so far I'm loving it. Um, I haven't actually, um, Actually, it hasn't even been a month. It's only been a couple of weeks. But uh, now, so now I, the I, big I, question: Have you run drippy corn yet? I haven't because okay. um, the grain jars that I did have almost fully colonized in ten days. They're just no, way too drippy corn, though, dude. <laughs> yeah, no, I know, <laughs> but be crazy. 
and, and that's what I was thinking, but I already had a lot of millet jars that were, you know, colonizing ready to go. So I didn't want to overload myself too much and have everything ready to go. Oh, but, see, uh, there's that time management coming into yeah, play. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The foresight for that. Um, because also I, I sterilize all my substrate. So um, I know a lot of people just run bucket text, just run quar, just run quar vermiculite. Um, I still do cow manure compost in mine. So I sterilize everything. Um, so that's another uh, time management component. And, you know, yeah, it's it's only, you know, sitting in the pressure cooker for three, three and a half hours, but you still have to time that stuff up to make sure you're doing other stuff during that time and not just staring at it for three hours because there's a lot of other stuff to do. <laughs> yeah, but, well, uh, with my ADHD, I'm never staring at it for three hours. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and, and that can... Yeah, that that can be a bonus for, you know, have, having a, a mentality like that and being able to do that and be able to bounce around. But uh, yeah, so I was running just, um, you know, no prep, no soak millet for a long time and uh, just in jars. Uh, I've never personally had a lot of great luck with bags, so I've just stuck with the jars. And um, yeah, it can be a pain to wash them all, all the time. But also, again, because I like to run so many different cultigens and stuff, I don't need massive amounts of, you know, grain spawn for each one each time. So, you know, doing a jar and then doing a bag and it, it works out. So, um, but yeah, like I was saying, I, I have switched to popcorn recently. And as far as everything's looking right now, I probably will be switching to it and staying with it um, because of how quick it's colonizing. And also I've noticed uh, with the millet, um, you know, uh, the contamination rate on the grain and granted, I run a lot of like TO plates and stuff like that too. So I expect that there could be some that just, you know, stall or don't do the best right out of the gate. But I, uh, with the millet, I would end up having probably about a, a 10 to 15%. Um, I, I don't really get a lot of, uh, actually, I can't remember the last time I had like, uh, any like trichoderma or anything like that, they just tend to stall and, you know, get like an off odor. So at that point I got plenty more coming. So I just toss them. Um, but, uh, with the popcorn, it's looking like, uh, almost a 0% so far out of, uh, about 40 jars that I've done. So man, all I know is for the amount of swabs, Dave Wombat, uh, is producing and moving. Um, you know, when I, he was one of my first podcasts and he said, look, man, the popcorn just, you know, it, it'll tell you when it's not, not looking right. And I, I was already, uh, loving popcorn, but still running a lot of other stuff. And I'm pretty much at a point now where it's really hard for me to go back yeah, uh, and, 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 and try something else. It just, uh, limited yeah. amount of time, you know, not everybody's going to be a vendor. Not everybody runs a commercial mushroom farm. Uh, some of us just have a limited amount of time and, uh, want everything to work out for those reasons right like we we don't want for to waste sure. our time and so for me it i i would say the only quality that the popcorn is inferior to maybe say millet about is if if you're running land race or you're running something that is notorious for being able to have a, a nice canopy so basically <clears throat> anything that manna from heaven runs um you know, where it's just all about those gorgeous canopies. Um, millet probably will give you a better canopy. The popcorn seems to want to cluster, uh, grows a little bit more, but not always. But other than that, I'm telling you, as far as working it, um, I love the prep for it. I don't know why, even though it's a two step process, uh, it still seems easier to me than, um, than doing no soak, no simmer. Cause I don't have that just meticulous weighing process for no soak, no simmer. So yeah, for a lot of reasons, I, I agree. And, um, whether you, you do the drippy corn version or you just run regular popcorn, uh, like Jeff's saying, it's, it, it's, it's worth giving a try if you've not tried it. Yeah, I definitely will be trying the drippy corn. I just wanted to, uh, you know, give it a go first on its own. So I got something to compare to also see what yep. the difference is. Exactly. So, all right. So, so you're, now you're running popcorn. You, you, you're not, uh, you don't do grain bags. I, I mirror that. And look, we live in the same area. Maybe, maybe there's something about this area that just doesn't work with grain bags. Um, I can buy them pre-sterilized and knock them up, but for some reason so far, I just have too high of a contamination rate where I'm, I'm not happy. Whereas my jars, zero. Yeah, no contamination ever. I, 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 
I mean, once in an absolute blue moon, I might get a sour smelling jar and toss it, but that's probably because of a weak genetic. But right. anyway, so all right, so so jars for grain. All right, now what do you grow in? Um, well, real quick too on the jars, even I even do unmodded uh, lids. I just Same. use the, uh, the the plastic lids, unscrew them a little bit. Yep. As soon as I take the pressure cooker lid off, tighten it up, and I don't have any issues with that because I just wanted to mention that because I see a lot of people, you know, that, uh, you know, try to insist on people buying a lot of the modded lids or making the modded lids. And right. like you said, too, some people are in this as just a hobby, don't have time or the money for the expense of all that. So right. Right. just to let people know it is possible and, and very well doable without all of that necessarily. Couldn't agree more. Now, there is something to know. So I do both the the no tech lid tech both with like the old school where there's the canning lid and then the ring. And I noticed, um, not, a, I mean, still really low contamination. I, I, I never tried other lids because of the contamination rate, but I did switch over to the plastic lids, uh, or an all stainless steel lid for the purpose of there's not that little slot then between the ring and, and the, um, the disc. Right. Right. So it's just, so that way contamination, it falls down over things. The, likelihood of it getting up in there is essentially zero um so yeah that's a, a good note about using those plastic lids because they're they're one piece lids um exactly yeah, i think that's the way to go so but yeah so um as far as what i'm growing uh a lot <laughs> a lot of different cultigens um I, I i like i said i i like so many different ones and but now do you grow in tubs or bags bags i've i actually switched in the past six months completely over to bags i was doing both for a while um even when i did the tubs i would mainly do just the the six quarts or um the 12 quarts um occasionally you know uh, especially earlier on i would do some of the 54 quarts or the 60 some quarts or whatever just to get a nice big tub full just to, to do it or whatever but um with running so many varieties and everything it's just it's really just not what i'm in it for at this point is to get like one massive amount of one you know certain specific one right and but, and also uh your your kitchen background like anybody that's ever worked in a kitchen like nobody wants to be the dishwasher oh yeah <laughs> nobody wants to wash those tubs nobody does i don't care who yeah. they are that's yeah. a fun part of the process so yeah for the, sure the bags it's just toss and and I've had this on my discord and I've seen this discussion other places where, um, you know, it's, I, and for a while unicorn bags, they were out of their biodegradable bags. And there were a few people that were very vocal about, Oh, well you can't, you know, it's your, you're so much plastic and, and all that stuff. And I think if you're quibbling about being like your average home grower, that's maybe growing at any given time. I mean, maybe not growing, but just a couple times a year or two, for me, maybe maybe I got two to six bags now. I've really scaled back now that I'm doing the podcast. Um, but you're not creating a lot of like your your plastic consumable game better be just impeccable before you start worrying about throwing a couple plastic bags out. You know what I mean? Like that's for sure. Grand scheme of waste and plastics, it's probably pretty low on the priority list now if you're a commercial uh grow operation uh, you know i could i could see a case from uh, maybe you're throwing a lot of that out but yeah i've i've never felt that to be super compelling I've ne I, I always reuse my empty bags as just i just stack them up and then they become garbage bags for me over time and you know they're used in the household that way i have heard people recycle them they they rinse them out and reuse them i don't have that kind of free time to I'll do that with some of them for, uh, and not even rinse them out, but like the ones that I sterilize substrate in, I'll run those until they, they pop a hole or melt, you know, and it's usually when I'm hydrating the, the sub that all of a sudden it's, right. it's leaking out the bottom and I'm going up, oh, well, that one's done, right. <laughs> you know, but, uh, yeah, I rerun those as many times as I can. So sometimes it's probably 10 or 15 runs before they actually even go bad. Right. Yeah. So. That's, uh, that's a good idea. I might have to try that. All right, so so you you run you you do your grain in jars, you run popcorn, you grow in bags. Um, I think it's about time we we look at some cultigens, maybe. Sure. And, and also yeah. uh, a quick note: you um you have a flow hood, I'm assuming. Yeah. 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 Okay. 
yeah, I do everything in front of the flow hood. I I did do the still air box thing like a lot of people, you know, for a little while starting off doing the uh, you know, uh no pour uh agar plates and yeah. stuff like that. I used little four ounce uh jars for a long time for those and uh you know, it, it worked for a long time, but mm -hmm. for ease and accessibility when you're starting to do more and more, it's just way way more fluent to be able to do it right in front of a hood. <laughs> And then especially once you're at the point where you're you're creating swab sets, you're selling swab sets, um, you know, the swab and fruit in a still air box versus in front of a flow hood. You, you just there's no way that's not improving the quality of the product by doing that. For sure. All right. So let, let's get into some of your I, I asked Jeff uh, before the show, uh, you know, hey, what what maybe grab a few cultigens you want to talk about so people can get an idea of some of your genetics. Um, so he sent me a few things, so we're going to pull some up. All right. You want to start with the uh, albino bayou barangay? Yeah, that's cool. All right. Let me pull it up. Here we go. All right. Uh, you tell me when you want to switch the photos, and uh, we'll, we'll I'll just listen to you tell me the story. Right on. Yeah, so uh, this is a cross of ape. Uh, the, uh, the ape that I have is like a real classic-looking ape with just the... Uh, you know, the closed cap, they're not giant fruits by any means, um, but they're, they're potent and they flush pretty well. But, uh, I wanted to, you know, of course, cross that up with some other stuff and see what I would get. And, uh, the albino, uh, Louisiana was one that I had run for a while. And, um, it kind of reminded me of, um, uh, Phobos and, you know, some of the tat and, you know, it was similar to those ones, but it seemed a little bit stronger to me from my experience and, uh, would, uh, flush, uh, with some, some pretty heavy fruits, um, nothing too crazy. They would still be like a, a smaller stem, but uh, a little heftier. And so after, uh, you know, double swabbing those two and, um, getting that going this year would, uh, it started off, uh, right off the bat. Uh, producing some of these and then uh, we can go ahead and click through the next picture um, i think this is just another uh, view of that one some some really gnarly gills on these and then uh, some of these smaller fruits too that just have uh not they're not quite as stocky but oh yeah there's another nice little chunky one but they had these uh it was pretty much either two phenotypes it was producing which was like these really fat ones or Similar to the albino Louisiana, but with a really blue um, center, which I think might be one of the, yeah, here. Um, the uh, albino Louisiana never did this for me, and I had run it for uh, three generations. It stayed pretty much the same, so it was pretty consistent. Um, so I really liked how these ones were turning out and uh, have continued to run it. And it, it still kind of produces both phenotypes a lot of times within the same bag and even flush. Um, so, yeah, here's another one. Yeah. Oh, it's awesome. I mean, I don't know. Every every time when I'm quiet for a while and then I start talking, I, I get like this like one second feedback over there. I don't know why. That's oh. <laughs> anyway. Now, so you, you use the, I, a lot of times I call it the ghetto swab or the double swab technique. Uh, Dave recently gave it a really complex name. I can't recall. I'm sure somebody in the comments will remember what that, what that term was. Um, but, you know, there are definitely instances for uh, the ghetto swabbing technique where you surely could go, well, you know, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't, sure. I don't know if this cross. But then there are other cases where you're like, man, it, you know, it doesn't look exactly like the two things it came from, you know, as they stand by themselves. So, I mean, what other explanation for it are you going to use? And, and that's kind of where I've gotten with a lot of it, you know, and I, I know everyone has their opinions about the, you know, the swab in that way, or, you know, whether going to mono carry on style. And I think they both have their great advantages. And for me, like, you know, is it a cross? Isn't it a cross? I, to be completely honest, like it, what I see it as is I put two things together and something different came out. So you know, can I go back and verify and say these mono carry ons, you know, clamped and this and that? No, not necessarily, but it's definitely a new cultigen that neither one of those parent, you know, cultigens were producing before, right. at least in my right. eyes from, from the, the running of the multiple ones before. Right. And now, so 
for everybody listening that maybe hasn't watched some of the other episodes about this, um, in breeding, um, where you're trying to cross two parent fruits and create a, a hybrid, a, a new fruit from that, um, you know, just mating them basically. Um, there are multiple ways to do it. One of the ways is if you have two different cultigens, as soon as they're they're you, you basically got to time this out right so that they're both the caps are opening up, they're dropping spores, or the spores are matured at the same time, and then you go in with one swab and you swab the gill of one cultigen, and with the same swab you swab the gill of another, and you typically go back and forth a few times. The idea is just to really mingle those spores together and then you expand that out uh germinate them on plates and the the hope is that it crossed and uh, you know it, if it didn't if one dominated over the other you'll know it right away because it'll just look like one of the parent fruits um, but anytime you get something new then there's a lot of people that go looks like i had a successful cross and and they, uh, you know, if they're vendors, they make that available for people or they, they share that genetic. And uh, there have been a lot of people outspoken uh, about that not being, you know, you can't say it's a real cross. You don't know, et cetera, et cetera. I think if you have pictures of the fruit that your swab came from, you're really untouchable, right? If If I got a swab and I'm like, okay, Jeff, I'm going to send you the swab. And then here on screen is the fruit it came from. Jeff knows what he's getting, right? He knows what he's getting. Whether, like Jeff says, is it a cross? Is it not? Um, who knows? But I know that the fruit look unique from from the two parents. I think that's just that's probably what matters at the end of the day. Um, you know, we're we're not running full genome sequences. We're not uh, checking out microsatellite. Uh, <laughs> regions of, of dna uh to figure out you know this that and the other thing so what really what people really care about uh and i'm sure jeff knows this is if they see a picture of a fruit and they buy a, a swab set of that they want their gross to roughly look like that a great example would be tim pig just released toke um, i saw the pictures i immediately salivated I gave him all my money and I got a couple uh, swab sets, uh, F7, F8, and uh, F7 looked definitely different than the pictures, but very close, close enough that I was not upset about it. Um, Jeff saw those fruits. He actually babysat those bags for me while I was uh, on my family vacation. Um, then the F8 bag looked pretty freaking different, right? Like it, 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 it had it had taken a different turn. Um, and I got excited about that. Cool. I'm going to clone those. We're going to see, see what happens with those. Um, but I think I might be a little bit different in that I'm okay. Uh, you know, I like toke because it was wild and crazy. I'm cool if it keeps acting wild and crazy, but when you're selling swabs, people pretty much want to know what they're going to be growing. And anytime it looks different, that's when they get upset. So I sorry, I just took a little moment to talk about that, but I think it's important to talk about the importance of um, having pictures of all your cultigens. If you sell a cultigen and you cannot produce a picture of it, that's you're going. That's where you get into some problems. Now there might be instances where you're selling an exotic culture that most people can't grow. You haven't grown, but for the sake of getting it out there, letting people have a chance at trying to grow it, like various wood lovers, uh, that might be a good exception to that rule. But generally speaking, you know, if Jeff says, hey, uh, isn't this fruit cool? And he sends me a swab set. I, I want at least a couple of my fruits to look like that picture. Right. That's that's fair. So whether you're verifying monocaryons under a microscope using serial dilution method or other street plate methods uh, or you just ghetto swabbing, if at the end of the day it produces something new that's relatively consistent and, and doesn't over the course of time revert back to one of the parents doesn't matter <laughs> that you didn't verify it under a microscope i don't know some right. for some people it might i would say for most people it would not matter one bit. thank you so as people as long as people are getting what they expect to be getting product wise that's that's when most people are going to be happy i mean and 
like uh, I think Dave pointed out too, which is a, a great point. Like I've always had full disclosure with everyone as far as anyone who gets anything from me or asks me any questions about anything. I've been completely open about everything that I've done. So it's not like, you know, there's any sort of, you know, question as far as what exactly it is or what's going on with it. Yeah. And then the other thing Dave does well, and I think you do this really well also, is you're frequently posting photos of new grows. You're, you, you're not, um, you know, this is no offense to anybody who does this, but if you, if you have that one picture from three years ago, and that's still the picture that you're using to show off that cultigen, um, and you're not, like Jeff says, uh, occasionally every few months or at least maybe every six months, rerunning that and making sure you know what you're actually putting out there, you know, then you're, you're a tier down. You're, you're not a top tier vendor. You're, you're doing, you're getting a little lazy. Um, now maybe there could be an argument for people who just maintain such huge libraries that that's improbable, or maybe they still have stock of things that are two years old. Um, but man, if I was selling swab sets that were two years old, I would need to intermittently be germinating one of those swabs to make sure that that stuff still works. Right. These are all just common sense things that if you're a reputable vendor and you want to keep your customers happy, you would likely be doing. Is exactly. Because if, if you send one thing out and someone's unhappy about it, I mean, this whole community is word of mouth. So right. that's all it takes is one person that, you know, and, and that's not the reason for me to keep people happy. It's just, that's, that's just the way you should do business. That's just yeah. how business is done. A good business is done anywhere. You know, like you don't want someone to get a product and be upset about the product they got plain and simple. Right. Yeah. You, right. You buy a bunch of bananas or, or I think a good example is every once in a while we go to Costco and we get a little flat of peaches. Right. And then you get home and you take a bite into it and it's just rotten to the core. People don't like that. I didn't buy a rotten. I don't want a rotten peach. Maybe you go back, you get a new flat of peaches, right? <laughs> All right. All right. So let's keep looking through these albino bayou uh, barangays. Yeah. So I really this, like um, this. Yeah. This this was uh, one of the more recent grows, um, actually, where I got a, a nice cluster of some real real fat ones there. But yeah, they so they've been pretty consistent. Or very consistent, I should say. I mean, it's like I said, those two phenotypes have pretty much been what they've shown, you know, for uh, I think these pictures are the third generation. I think I have the fourth generation going now. So. Nice. I like those. All right. So, again, we're talking with Jeff Karras of the fun fun uh, blah, Fungus Frequency. Uh, we just took a look at his albino bayou barangue that was a, a cross between ape and albino Louisiana fruits using um, the uh, double cross method. Uh, how about we get into the natal moon? Yeah. Yeah. Do that All right. So next one up, natal moon. So this one was uh, a double swab of natalensis and phobos. And uh, so there again, um, you know, double swabbed them. Uh, I can't say exactly what happened, but something else came out. Um, and uh, these hadn't, I, I ran both Phobos and Natalensis for quite a while. They're two of my favorite cultigens for the fact that they were so uh, aggressive, you know, as far as contamination or anything like that. Like it, it seemed like neither one of them cared, you know, it was like, whatever. <laughs> so um, just figure put two aggressive things like that together and see what happened. And these came out, this was, um, I believe the, the second generation, um, the first generation was honestly, um, I can't remember, maybe I didn't put any pictures in there, but they, they were very, um, they looked kind of like Phobos, but they were just very plain white. Um, but, uh, so then the second generation, I got a lot more of, uh, a phenotypes to pop up. And then here by like the, I think this is the third generation or so, um, third or fourth, this is pretty much where they've, uh, kind of stabilized to. At least it seems at this point, never know with mushrooms, but um, these have been pretty consistent now running like this and uh, been a favorite of a lot of the people that I've uh, vended to. And then this is actually another phenotype that popped up when I went back to the uh, F1 and ran it again and obviously completely different. Um, and then from this here, these ones, uh, 
I've still been running these ones a little bit, um, which are real nice. But I actually got a uh, blob culture um, from this too, which started. Uh, and here's a, Ooh. yeah, this is actually um, the first full bag I have going of it. It uh, it was some fins that popped up on a, a plate, and so I cloned those. And uh, this thing is so aggressive that um, in the bags, I, I think I'm actually going to try some of uh, the banding method around the bag because I haven't had a lot of issues with the side pins, but this thing literally pinned all the way around the entire block. And so I'm not sure how well it's actually going to fruit uh, in the top there. Like, oh, oh yeah. So the, the, those pictures, I think that was actually the uh, the, the F1 of that cross. Oh, okay. I might put those at the end. But All right. So yeah. this is important to talk about. Um, I just want to walk the viewers through this. So, all right. So from crossing um, uh, Ned Lensis with uh, Phobos, the the f using the 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 double swab method the the f1 is looking pretty very similar enough to phobos where you might go okay maybe maybe that was just the maybe that's just phobos but right. but then you keep running it because f1 you never know right that's that basic mendelian genetics where the dominant traits are going to come out in that first cross things don't get spicy till the second and, and third generations. Uh, uh, Dave Wombat was the first to talk about this in one of the first podcasts, and, and we've reiterated this multiple times. So then you go from that very phobos looking fruit to this, and then now you go, oh, okay, maybe maybe there was a cross here. And then, and then it settles out a little bit into something that's distinct from phobos and, and natalensis. Um, and I would say I see it in the, the tapering of the the um, stipe and, and the cap a little bit there. Um, so I, I'm a believer. And, and then you're saying, and then this is something else I want to highlight. Um, Ed Grand uh, was the first to talk to me about this uh, in depth, but but it was truly first brought up with, with Dave Wombat, which is this idea of F1 fruits, right? They're going to be the dominant traits of that cross. They might not be that interesting. You have to keep going. But with that said, a lot of people, they, you know, they're doing a limited amount. Let's say they do a hundred swab sets from F1 fruits. The average breeder, they're not running a hundred tubs of F1 fruits. So what are they leaving on the table? Right. That, that was, Ed was the first to talk to me about this. What are you leaving on the table? You got, even if you ran a hundred swab sets, there's way more genetics. You know, that, that meiosis process is going on on every basidia inside every fruit. So there's literally, I mean, maybe not an infinite, but an insane amount of genetic possibility from the F1 spores. And so here, here's a case of Jeff going back to his F1 spores from that fruit. <laughs> right? Fruits that look yep. like this, the next generation look like this. Yeah. So that's why if you start playing and we, I have a little uh, private group in, in my discord where we work a lot of F1 and F2 genetics and uh, they grow it out. And a lot of times they go, ah, oh, so disappointing, but you got to know the game. Just be patient. I was like here. So I don't know. Do you call this natal moon too? What do you call this brown moon? Like I, I, just for my own labeling purposes was just calling it big brown okay. natal moon big brown but uh yeah i haven't really um i haven't run that one quite as much to really put it out there or anything mm -hmm. like that um i got a couple buddies who kind of like you were talking who when uh they've grown out natal moon and liked it you know i've been like hey well do you want a couple different clone cultures or different you know uh generation mm -hmm. cultures that i have to play with them so there's a couple other people that have been kind of been playing with them too that have got this to repeat a little bit um, and a little different too. But uh, yeah, so mm -hmm. the the blob and then the other one is what I've been really trying to focus on. <laughs> so he, this is what's fascinating to me. Uh, again, if if you're, you got Phobos and you got Natalensis and then this is your, your F2 fruits, there's no possible way you can say that cross didn't take. Now, because here's the deal. Hear me out. Maybe you can go, well, I don't know. You know, it's still, there's a lot of traits that are like Phobos here. Um, 
and especially, oh, come on, man. I mean, that's your F1. Give me a break. But if you took swabs of these fruits and it made that fruit, now your your probability of successful uh, breeding, I mean, I don't know how you pull that one off. You, you're going to tell me that natalensis, just that's a different morphological expression of that? Come on. So anyway, uh, and, and even in the beginning, Ed, uh, Ed Gran was very much like, yep, you got serial dilute, you got to isolate the monocaryons out, have to, have to, have to. And uh, as he got like, I don't know, 50 crosses in, and he was like, dear God, this is too much work. Um, he, and then he just started sending me swabs, like just massive packs of swabs to give out to people because he's like, I can't do all this work. He, you know, then he said, I mean, I, I'm... Seems like the 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 smash crosses or the uh, ghetto cross looks like it's it's working sometimes. It's really about the work. Where is your work going to be, right? So if you do uh, if you're doing the ghetto cross, you got to grow a bunch of stuff out, and you might not succeed, and you got to be okay with that. Now your failure, it's kind of like an escalator, right? Well, uh, what's a broken escalator? It's just a set of stairs, right? It still works. You just got to do a little bit more work yourself. <laughs> So, you know, did the cross work? Okay, it looks like it didn't. I still got a tub full of fruit. So, you know, it's it's not a, it, it's a win, maybe not a hyper win, but, you know, it, it's still not a bad situation. So, for sure. I am, I am also uh, a, a fan of both techniques, and I think some people will be drawn more to one than the other. So I, this is a great uh, example of that. And here now you have a, even a third expression from that. and. We've seen it in the uh, Grand Design Project, we've seen a little bit of instability, whether it's on agar plates or it's in the grow. But I think that's also just part of the game, right? Like some things shake out well. Um, it's like with people when, when you have a mixed race couple, a lot of times, you know, makes really pretty babies every once in a while. <laughs> whoops <laughs> right I, so you know in this case though this whoops this might be fun somebody might like growing this just to experience that morphology for sure i think that's i think that's cool and look how yeah. weird those are yeah and that that's that was more of that uh that f1 that's because like i said phobos was always real consistent for me like with the really dark cap center and everything and right. I, I ran it a lot even multiple generations because i loved it but uh when i saw this i'm I'll be honest, I was even myself kind of disappointed. I'm like, wow, from that cross, I just got these really, really plain white looking fruits. Uh, okay, but well, let's see what happens. <laughs> right. You took the next step, and that, that yeah. was important. All right. So, uh, next up. Now, you didn't have a name on these, you just have the cross. I don't know if you've come up with a name yet, but we're going to pull up. Oh, yeah. No, I, this is just the first generation, actually. So, I don't have a name. Um, All right, so oh, what what did you cross here? So this is tidal wave and ape tar, and uh, I I just re this is you know I just recently did these, um, and uh, I had gotten the tidal wave uh, a little bit back from uh, Uncle Jay, mm -hmm. and uh, so I was running that, and me and him had talked about you know we had some similar projects that uh, we were doing, and he reached out to me and wanted to try kind of getting some stuff going, so. This is one of the things that I decided to go ahead and try to get going from his tidal wave and then the ape tar that I was working with. And, um, I, you know, sometimes things just work out too well, almost in a way, because yeah. <laughs> when I when I did this, I, I literally in my mind, I had two different expressions that I was hoping for. And I got both of them in the first generation in two separate bags. Wow. And so right, this is... hopefully they stick around. Time will, uh, time will tell, but yeah, this yeah. It's we'll definitely see. looking like a successful cross knowing, uh, having grown both, both these cultigens. Yeah. So I was, I was hoping to get, yeah, and here's the other one. So I was hoping to get like an ape tar kind of one like that. The other ones, the first ones, um, you know, just maybe a little bit more, um, open cap kind of thing just to see mm -hmm. what would happen, you know? And, uh, yeah, and then you can go ahead and to the next ones. And then, you know, I was trying to, I was hoping for, you know, kind of an ape tar tidal wave, but a little more tidal wave looking, but maybe, you know, plump, you know, a little chunkier kind of thing, which 
kind of looks like exactly what popped up here for me. And uh, got some really, really cool um, chunky fruits here with some some really nice gills on them and stuff. And, uh, you know, like I said, this is first generation. And I've run the tidal wave three times um, from him in the same bags, in the same environment. Run ape tar a number of times. Neither one has ever looked like this or the other. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, again, I, I'm not guaranteeing there was a... a, a, a Breeding that happened, but I got something new and something different. <laughs> so, yeah, look at. I mean, these are cool, man. I, I mean, particularly if, if if I could grow some that looked like that, that would be pretty pretty cool. Yeah, I I got tons of uh, clones taken, and those will definitely be getting run and and see where they go from there, and keep going with the next generations also because. Typically what I do is I, I swab the fruits that I love and I clone the fruits that I love and then I run both and I see what I get. And if going the next generation, they pop up again, then I keep running with it. If the clone keeps going with what I was hoping for, I run with that some more. I got a question. So here the, the gills are blue. This is a really attractive uh, gill coloration. Is that off the caps that are more brown or is that off of? No, that was actually, um, I think the that's, pick got flipped around from the beginning. That was from okay, those. So that's from those. Okay, I just wanted yeah. to clarify that. So the two yeah. phenos so far from this first grow is either a little bit more ape tarish, but as someone who's grown ape tar a few times, that's not what ape tar looks like. But right. Um, so so yeah, the these which are I love a bullet like morphology or like a missile type fruit. That's why I like you know ODP type fruits. So this yeah. this is a nice fruit. These are nice to harvest. They they store well. Everything about fruits that look like this are are, are my cup of tea. I love growing these because they're fun. I mean, I don't like drying these fruits. I, I don't like <laughs> storing these fruits, but um, just for the novelty of growing them, um, especially man, if you're gonna swab them, I mean, it doesn't get much better than that for swabbing a fruit, dude. <laughs> for sure, for those sure, are, those are amazing. All right, yeah. so. So that was uh, yet to be named. Uh, you know, hey guys, if you got a really cool name, you know, just shoot uh, Jeff and Jeff the idea. Maybe you'll you'll come up with the name for him. Never know. For now, Tidal Wave X uh, Ape Tar. Yeah. All right. So next up, we have uh, Albino Monkey Mac. Oh yeah, yeah. All right, let's do this one. All right, there might be. There was a. Did I do picture? It, it might have went at the the back of the pictures or the end of them or whatever, but, uh, yeah, yeah. The one in the okay. tub. So the first time I actually, I crossed, um, I swabbed ape and Melmac TP mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, in, in my goal of trying to get a bigger version of ape that was still maintaining some potency and, you know, that nice thick, you know, strong fruit. Right. Um, so this was the single albino that popped out of, um, in the next picture, the previous picture, I guess. Um, this was a uh, an outdoor tub that I did that is literally just a uh, a, a toy box outside. <laughs> the uh, the grain spawn got um, slightly contaminated. And this was actually when I was trying some bags of grain spawn uh, last year. And so the spawn got slightly contaminated, but there was so much spawn in there that was still looking good that um, I had had a little bit of luck before with putting a couple tubs that had gotten uh, trichoderma on them outside. And it seemed like out in the sun or the air or whatever, it just died back and they were able to fruit. They didn't successfully, you know, flush multiple times still, but I was at least able to get something out of them. Right, and right. so I was like, well, let's see what happens if I just throw this contaminated bag of spawn into an outdoor tub. And this is what came up from the, the ape and Milmac TP. And then after this all flushed through, that other picture that one tiny little single albino that popped up and that's what i cloned and um so that's what led to these previous pictures now of this so another great that example is, that is bad ass i'm just gonna tell you right now that's a cool fruit i mean talk about again the whole knocking it out of the park like what you just said you wanted to do. I want an eight, but I want it to be a, you know, ha have some of the heft and, and vibe of a Melmac. I, I mean, I think it has maybe a touch more Melmac, but still, dude, that's right. That's pretty yeah. great. 
I was I was extremely happy with it. Um, you know, so this this year, the you know, just... now now I see a little more of the the okay maybe maybe you see and I've had this happen too just with fruits in general. Um, you know, it they can have a completely different character up to that first veil break and that early ma- maturing process. But if you let them go, they can just take on a whole nother look. Uh, For sure. Maybe. maybe that. Yeah. Yeah, man, that's again, boy, you know how to, you know how to do them to make them easy to swab. I mean, I, the <laughs> last like 10 things I've run have just not been good for swabbing whatsoever. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting jealous. Like, man. <laughs> Need some yeah, of those I, things. I, I, I was really I excited. I gotta go to Jeff's house, man. I can't get some of stuff. <laughs> but yeah, just an, another great example too of uh, you know s- sometimes a tiny little fruit, you know yep. that the, the size of of whatever you're cloning isn't necessarily indicative of what they're gonna you know repeat morphology wise for for future grows. Right. Yep. So now I got a question. I'm looking at the substrate. Um, is that just cocoa core? No, that's a bunch of, uh, it was some leftover, um, substrate with, uh, the common manure compost, uh, core and, uh, vermiculite. Oh, okay. okay. So it does have manure. All right. That's a good idea. I'm gonna have to try this this summer. Now I'm not going to lie. I don't really get contamination anymore, but, um, n- knock on wood, yeah. but, but yeah, if I do, it. I'm going to just toss it outside and see what happens. <laughs> All right, so we did that. And and again, that is a great story. I remember I dude, I, I'm not even gonna lie. I don't remember what cultigen it was. This was super early on. But I'm talking maybe one of my first five or six tubs. I threw an albino and I remember thinking, Oh, that's neat. Just dried it and moved on. <laughs> like I didn't know. At the right. Time, I, I didn't know. And I remember there was a period of time where I did remember what the cultigen was. And I was like, oh, I don't think there's an albino of this. So uh, I, I was even more sad for him. <laughs> now, I, this is actually the first time I've talked about this, uh, where I was like sort of ashamed of myself for, for throwing away that opportunity. But yeah. Um, I think the other lesson in your story is, uh, you know, sometimes if you run contaminated tubs, it stresses things out. And you can get a cool revert, you can get a cool albino, maybe you just even get a cool morphology that you can repeat through cloning. So it's, uh, you know, Dave said this before, and now you're reiterating it. You know, if you don't run it, you just don't know. Like, Absolutely. It's worth running it. All right. So uh, I'll do a quick little update. If you guys are just tuning in, uh, we're talking to Jeff Karras of the Fungus Frequency. We're walking through some of his uh, uh, current favorite uh, cultigens. And so next up, let's do last but not least. This is one I've never seen you show. I don't know if this is the debut of it or not, but uh, I cannot recall seeing photos of this. I've I've posted it. This, oh, well, have. this okay. this here is actually what started the whole project. Um, this was just okay. a, a PE mutant fruit that mm-hmm. uh, popped up in a bag of. Uh, there was some nice other like plump like fruits, not like normal. Uh, you know, like bell shaped caps or nothing PE, but, uh, some, some fat fruits. And then there was this one with like, you know, as you can see the three sets of gills that were where you would normally see like the cap. I've never seen that in my life. (laughs) So I, I cloned that and actually, um, had taken clones from some of those fatter fruits too, and was running those cultures for a while. Um, and just continued getting some, some bigger PE type fruits, but nothing too crazy. And had kind of actually forgot about this one and uh, then went back, took a fresh transfer from it and started running it. And that's when all sorts of craziness started. And it, this one here, Ghidorah, these, these here, like I get these, uh, I don't know what else to call them other than like pseudo caps because they look like caps, but there are no gills in them. They are completely just normal mushroom tissue. Um, I think in the next, there might be another picture of these like type of things. Um, or yeah. Okay. There, yeah. There's the, uh, that so-called cap, um, cut open. And, uh, so I get some of those fruits and then some, some really gnarly monster, um, spore dropping fruits. And, uh, yeah, it was, these gills are just crazy. That might be one of the greatest gill porn picks i've ever seen in my life that is 
that is a pretty great photo. So now, what do you call this? Gilmore? Ghidorah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Like from Godzilla. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I mean, I claim to be a geek, but I might not be a nerd because I, I don't even know that reference. Right on. All right. Yeah. Now, what do yeah. we got here, dude? And then this is some of the uh, Ghidorah's brains, basically. Some of the, the blobs that pop up and and now it'll do all three of these things in the tub or in a tub or bag whatever all at the same time okay um so that's why i went with Ghidorah, you know kind of three-headed monster um kind of feel um but yeah that's and then i think some of the next pick that's yeah that's another pick of the uh the brain like kind of uh blob thing that it grows it's like it's very like corally looking almost um but uh yeah and then yeah and then this was one of the, the really gnarly fruits that uh these, all right these... i might need a minute dude I might need a minute. <laughs> this has two qualities that that i'm very um that i i, I just truly like can't get enough of the super <laughs> gnarled top of the stipe and then uh the cracked cap that right there that just looks like a snack, dude. <laughs> Not gonna lie. That's like forget Same. Pringles. That I just need a bag of those. That looks like what I'm all about right there. Right. I like that. Yeah, I th I think oh. this fruit here was actually when I I had been calling it just the PE Mutant Project and and had kind of Ghidorah floating around in my head and then when I saw this it was uh, that's when I went ahead and just started calling it that. All right, that's got to be Ghidorah type 1 right there. That's yeah that's, yeah that's the you know that's the sexy cousin and then you know the mutant that's the ugly cousin right for sure. right yeah oh dude that's what i'm all about right there all right so here's the next project dude you got to take uh el choco and you got to cross it with this now that would be awesome i don't actually have el choco but that would be awesome oh uh, well I'll, I'll, I'll come over i, I, I can make it happen, <laughs> make it happen. <laughs> All right, and again with the gills, <clears throat> dude. Yeah. Some nice gills, especially the at you know at like uh, nine o'clock. Cool. Yeah, yeah. That's a great photo. And then here yeah. are those like not cap caps. Like, <laughs> yeah. Like, marshmallow caps or something. Right. It's I I haven't seen anything else do it like that. I'm I'm sure someone else has somewhere at some point, but it's it's a one and only for me. I have also not seen that. <laughs> and then these are some of just the other you know i guess pe fruits mm -hmm, a little you bit know like the pe yep yeah cool man but yeah so well that's pretty much cool that's some new stuff you know i've had a lot of people on and we've seen a lot of stuff that's uh you know there's some stuff in there that's that's new to the ice for sure especially that Ghidorah. oh my goodness we're we're gonna have to talk I'm yeah, to, yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. Uh, I hope you, I hope you uh, had some swabs available when you harvested those fruits, because oh yeah, those those look great. Yeah, I um, actually did a a giveaway at one point and gave out a handful of them online. So okay, see, see if anyone else has them popping up soon. We'll see. <laughs> Man, I don't know how it works for you, but I'll have people I gave some swabs to like a year ago, and then they'll finally get around to working it. And I just had this happen uh, yesterday. I had like four different people message me showing me pics of uh, uh, fruits and they're all like, man, I wish I would have ran this stuff sooner. This stuff's all amazing. And I'm like, man, I have almost forgot about those. But yeah. that's awesome. Cool. Send me some now because I don't have any more of those. Right. Yeah. <laughs> a year ago. <laughs> yeah. But so I before you go, I want to just talk about that a little bit. You know, that relationship that you got with, with Kyle, um, the relationship I have with, with a bunch of people, I won't go into names now, but um, that like uh, not and there's nothing wrong if you want to be the Wizard of Oz, if you want to toil late into the night all by yourself until it's perfected and then just, you know, dazzle and, and amaze us like Tim Pig did with uh, with Toke. That's great. I think there is definitely, however, uh, a, a strong case to be made for making a, a, a breeding or cultivating decision that fosters the connection uh, and, and strengthens the community. And I think that 
finding people you can work F1 and F2, even F3 spore swabs with. And, uh, you know, that sharing back and forth. I know you have that with Kyle. I know you have it with Raymond. Um, and I know Ray, that's his style anyway. He's been doing that for years. Um, and he's talked about that. I think that's a really important message for everybody getting going. Um, you know, if you, hey, there's no, you can be brand new, but you, all you got to do is watch this podcast and it doesn't take long to figure out how to, you know, get going and breeding. If you're doing that, you it's where you're going to make a decision. Am I going to be that guy that, uh, you know, wants to do it all by himself? I think my advice is you will quick, quickly learn how much work that is. For and, sure. And for the sake of getting to something cool, you know, don't be afraid of uh, sharing the work. That's, that's absolutely my message. And, and when we, I don't know, when we, when we grow together, we all, we literally grow together. Like, you know, we're all forming bonds and Dude, communities. That is a t-shirt. When we grow For together, sure. we grow together. Okay, Absolutely. just got a new T-shirt. Speaking <laughs> of T-shirts, though, I'm seeing some T-shirts yeah. in the back. Talk, tell me about those, because some people might want to get some of those. Yeah, um, working on uh, getting all that available soon, so everyone can cool. keep their eyes out for that. They'll be uh, coming out soon. Some uh, some hoodies and some T-shirts, a couple different varieties. Some are uh, embroidered, and then yeah. some are um, sublimation. So a couple different uh, varieties will be coming out soon. Oh, that's great. Uh, I, and I can vouch for him. Jeff was over at my house not too long ago and uh, I saw him and they look sharp, man. They're, they're high quality shirts. So I'm definitely going to have to snag one when, when, when they're ready. Uh, but now if people want to reach you, um, I, I know for a while you were only on Facebook, but you're on Instagram now you're on discord. Um, so there's lots of ways. All that'll be in the description below. Um, and uh, you know, like I, I was saying before, He's got swabs, he's got prints, he's got LC, um, you know, he, and even if it isn't listed, he might even have it, who knows? So, you know, he's, he's a guy worth reaching out to if you're looking for something. Absolutely. I, I do a lot of the, mainly LCs and the, the agar cultures is just because that's mainly what people want. You know, um, I, I was doing a lot more of the swabs before and I've kind of backed off on keeping too much of a backlog of those oh, just okay. because, um, I, I keep them for personal and for, you know, for trades and stuff like that and everything. But I don't get a lot of people who are looking for those, honestly. Right. Um, so. And and to be fair, right, for a lot of people, that first phase of cultivation is I see a picture. Ooh, ah, I want to I want to grow that. And uh, if you get a swab set, you're there's going to be some variety. I don't care what the swab set is. I mean, unless it's like a real basic cube. Um, Right. So yeah, the, that that's probably why liquid culture, uh, plate cl cultures, um, are typically a clone of something. Jeff can show a picture of a fruit of and say, "That's literally where it came from." It is that exact dicaryotic culture. Um, the odds of you growing something that looked like that are are very high. So, right. Yeah, that's and that's that's great. Like you've said before too, a lot of people are just trying to get their first or maybe even their fourth or fifth grow, and maybe don't have. The time, patience, or or even just desire to necessarily go the whole agar route and and do all that stuff, and they just want to grow some mushrooms, and that's fine too. Yeah, at the end of the day, you got to figure out for you. You can be the guy that says I'm going to do everything. They do everything for a couple years, and then I can't tell you how many people I talk to where they're like, you know what? I'm I decided I'm gonna start sourcing my grain now. Like they're just right. sick of sterilizing grain, so they're like, who should I go to? So I tell them who to go to. Or, uh, you know what? I don't want to do my sub anymore. Who can I get sub from? Or you can start the other way. You can do nothing except for just, you know, like uh, being a cook in the kitchen, putting the recipe, putting the ingredients in the bowl and growing some mushrooms. And then at that point, slowly go, I want to try agar. I want to try this. I want to try that. But there's like he said before, there's no right way to do it. So whatever you want to do at the end of the day, this is about having a good time, getting involved in mushroom cultivation for, you know, the medicinal benefits that come from any of the mushrooms you might grow. Um, and then also the, the, the therapy that comes from the, the cultivation itself. So Absolutely. it doesn't matter how you do it, man. There's no rules yeah. here. There's for no sure. police going up. Oh, you're using rye berries. You didn't know you're not <clears throat> supposed to use those anymore. Yeah, you can use them. It doesn't matter whatever you want to do. All right, man. Well, uh, thanks for uh, stopping by and uh, got to get yeah. me one of them T-shirts soon. And we're going to have to get that. Uh, I'm going to have to get some of these genetics from here. Definitely. We'll get you hooked up. We'll get you all hooked up.
<laughs> All right, dude. Well, thanks for being here, Jeff. Uh, I'll see you later. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, my pleasure. All right, guys. So that was Jeff Karras of the Fungus Frequency. Uh, next up, we are going to sit down and talk to an old friend of the show, uh, Gary Hefferly of Fresh from the Farm Fungi. Uh, a lot of new stuff in Gary's life. He's moved uh, out of downtown Denver. He's got a nice little house in the mountains now. Uh, he's building, a, what do you call it, a Quonset, um, and w w which which was an interesting ordeal. Um, and so now he's got a nice uh, 1,500 square foot, uh, you, you know, growth space. And we're going to get to uh, get into some details about uh, what what scaling up is looking like for Gary, uh, as well as get into uh, a topic I've been trying to get into, which is cordyceps cultivation. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome to the show Gary Hefferly of Fresh from the Farm Fungi. All right, dude. Well, thanks for being here. Um, I'm not going to lie. I can tell you didn't hit the makeup department before you got here, Gary. You, you look yeah. like you've worked a hard day today, my friend. That's why I wear the cap. I usually wear your cap. It's right over there. Uh, uh, Sweet. You, you got like the best baseball cap there is. It's my favorite. Well, it means a lot. Yeah, I got the uh, dad hair, the new dad hair going. Um, dad hair. So, yes, yeah. my, uh, my son is almost five months old now, and it's uh, been a long day. Right now it's one forty, Denver, and I right. woke up at uh, 4 a.m. to film a video on mycology lids and uh okay. i filmed it edited it and uploaded it by 5 45 and my son woke up at like 5 58 so wow. narrow window to get to get my content out there yeah. but uh yeah well i definitely can feel your pain on that one i'm uh slipping them in wherever i can that's for sure um, the, well, I appreciate every minute. Oh, oh, I'm glad. I can't help it. I'm, I'm, you know, we all have, uh, you know, if you're young, you're going to have a midlife crisis. If you're my age, you're probably having it. And, you know, convertible, that seemed boring. Cheating on my wife, that seemed boring. Uh, so I was like, okay, let's go down the mycological rabbit hole. That's what yes. we did. So before we get going, since you, um, it's obvious you, uh, you're a total dad now, like it took three seconds and you're already talking about your kid. So let's, uh, let's just do a little, uh, little humble brag here. <laughs> there we go. Rocking my favorite hat of all time. Yes. Got it right here, guys. This is a great hat. It's 25 bucks. It's the same price as mine, but I'm not going to lie. You know, I won't be mad at you guys if you go go buy Gary's before you buy mine. It's a cool hat. I wear it a lot. Well, I appreciate it. It uh, it took a while to find that, that leather patch that I was going mm -hmm. for, and uh, I really enjoy it. And the camo I picked out for mushroom hunting, which actually the morels just started popping here in Denver. So this weekend, I'm hoping to get out with uh, the little one and my wife and uh, do our annual morel hunt. And then, uh, yeah, this picture here, we, we just planted a bunch of wildflowers and the snow has finally melted a little bit in Sedalia, which is, okay. uh, that's where our new farm is. And it's 7,400 feet. And right now I'm at 5,200 feet in Denver. So it's a little bit of a climb, yeah. about 30 minutes from our house. And, uh, yeah, so somewhere in the middle is where the morels are. That's my clue. Nice. Now, okay, I got to ask, um, because, man, he is straight hawking the camera person. Who was taking that picture? Because, I mean, I feel like I feel like he's either mad at the camera person or he's like, <laughs> he's like, hurry it up. Yeah, so that's my wife. Okay. And, uh, he just was woken up from the car ride, okay. so that's that's what's going on. He's like, right. I fell asleep in uh, my lovely couch in Denver, and then I woke up, and now I'm in the mountains, and what, what is going on? And then uh, I tried to put some seeds in his hand, and no. he ended up, you know, it just got all over his slobbery, slobbery hands, and uh, yeah. But and anyway. started eating the seeds, and yes, it was all downhill <laughs> from there. Yeah. All right. So. Man. Well, so in this picture, uh, I see uh, if, if anybody who follows you on social media knows that you got yourself into, and I'm going to use a new word for myself here, a quonset. Is that yes. right? Did I say that right? All right. That so this right. quonset, um, 
which your salesperson told you was going to just be the easiest thing in the world to assemble. It, it was a little more work, right? Yeah. So he told me two days. It took a little bit longer than that. I think it was 18 months from when we uh, broke ground until this uh, picture here, which is our first batch. So that's awesome. A little bit longer than two days. But um, yeah, I'm super happy that it's up and going. It's like a, like a brand new level in mushroom cultivation. So I feel like, you know, if I'm equating it to like a video game, I just got to the next level and I'm learning all these new skills again. Um, you know, there's a, I got this new style of a tent so that I can have tours. So I was okay. aiming for the windows. That's kind of like I'm describing this picture here. Right. Um, built a little bit larger shelves. We were doing 10 pound bags, which up until this point, I've always done five pound blocks so okay. that I had uh, the variance in. Um, different species that I was growing. So I like to have eight to 10 different varieties for the farmer's market. Okay. And now that I have the space, I can incubate 10 pound blocks and still keep that same goal. So, all right. Uh, so what is your first yeah. flush weight on like, say some oysters off those blocks? It's about 2.2 pounds okay. on the first flush and maybe one pound on the second flush after that. And then, uh, our uh, building is set up so that it's like a continuous process and then out the back door. So there's two garage doors and then I'm just chucking them down this, you know, 150 foot hill. And that has streamlined my, uh, my, my cleaning yeah. tremendously, which that's my least favorite part of mushroom growing. So yeah. I kind of designed this building from start to finish to just be like, I'm not going to move these blocks as more than four feet. And then I'm just going to chuck them out the back. Right. Okay. So, I mean, you're, you're, you've d been doing content creation way longer than I'm doing it. But, uh, the minute I heard you say that I immediately envisioned you like doing a YouTube video about making like a giant, like slingshot or like a catapult <laughs> or something. I'm telling you, man, that. I, I will come to Denver. We will build it and we are going to do some, some block chucking, dude. Oh, that would sound so fun. Like a that trebuchet. Would... Yes. Oh, <laughs> now you're getting super bougie on me, dude. Trebuchet. Okay. Yeah. Build a All giant right. one and just launch them into the forest. <laughs> <laughs> that. Okay. I, it's got to happen. I mean, right. I, it doesn't have to be top of your list, but it, it, it better get on your list. Or right, I'm coming so... in and we're building it. Anyone who's a physicist out there, you email me those plans, fresh from the farm and give me a couple go. years and I'll drop that video. There you go. Now, okay, so um, are you happy you went from five to 10 pound blocks? So far, yes. Okay. So, the what have what has been you, the benefits for you? Yes. And then what, what were like the hiccups of getting there? Okay, so benefit wise is my, my, time cost per block is the same and i'm doubling my yield so okay. kind of bottlenecks when you're making one block it are inoculation points and then sterilization but i just doubled up my sterilizers so basically i'm doing the same amount of work but producing twice the yield the okay. the drawback is that um they just weigh more. So I had to build sturdier shelving. I had to have more space, but I kind of prepared for that. And, um, there, if you get contamination, then you're losing double the, right. the amount. So you have to have more, um, you know, precautions in place, which I like to do a grain master and then go into a five pound grain bag now just because the risks of, uh, you know, contamination doubled. So that is one change that I made as well as once a month, I'm making uh, grain master jars and, uh, and one pint glass jars. And then that way, it's like a sub step between my grain bags, which I'm using to inoculate about 10 bags each. So I'm doing about half, half a pound of grains to 10 pounds. Yep. 
so that's a pro tip. Um, I, I, I'm back to quart jars cause I'm just growing a bees. I'm doing the podcast now. I'm just trying to grow less mushrooms. Plus I was just drowning in them. I couldn't keep up. I didn't know what to do with them all. Um, yep. but I will say that when you're knocking up bags, um, you know, the, everybody's rule of thumb is, Oh, you just squirt some LC in there. Or you drop a puck in there. No, you grain to grain those bags. Yes. You take a small bag or a small jar and then inoculate with that. Uh, I, 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 I had no problems when I was doing that versus knocking up specifically with liquid culture. So that's what you're saying, right? You're, you're knocking up those 10 pound bags with grain Grains. spawn from another bag. Yes. And then okay. from, from that bag, one step prior, I'm doing my liquid into a jar. Right. And that way it's like a time stamp or like a quality control. And then once that's, you know, thrown out and I know that it's clean, then I'll do the five pound bag because, you know, there's a high rate. 10% at this time of year with all the trichoderma in the air right. is pretty common for, you know, going LC to grain. So if I'm cutting that down into a little jar, then my waste is much less. Right. Um, once so what, what I, do you uh, think overall yeah. that adding that step is, is improved and, and overall reduced? Like are, are you really, by the time you're getting to the 10 pound blocks, like from back when you were running, I don't know how far back this is, but when you're just going LC to five pound blocks versus, yep. you, you know, these intermediate steps now, like how low are you getting your contaminate down to even in those bad? I mean, systems? it's almost, it's almost nothing. And okay. I was dealing with, you know, one to 10%, depending on the time of year. So right. I think my waste is like minimal, but up until then, it wouldn't matter as much if I lost you know, three or four bags out of a hundred when it was a five pound block compared to three or four bags out of a hundred when it's a 10 pound block, that's much different. So that's kind of, you know, uh, it was worth it to me to do, uh, to break it down into minutes and, you know, the cost analysis. And I think that just my experience is like, this is a new building. I want to keep contams out as long as possible. So that's a, that's another reason is like in that jar, it is locked and sealed and right. I could take it a hundred yards away to open that thing up. And, uh, yeah. So I like that. That's, that's a great, uh, that's a great tip. And that's something that I, I didn't learn for a little while. And then as soon as I knew it, then it just changed how I thought about a lot of things like, Oh, I can play these little games and I can add a couple steps. It's not really adding a lot of time, but it's, it's like you just said, you're catching that contamination in a smaller jar, right? In whatever the container is, tossing a pint jar or a quart jar is a lot, you know, you're not going to shed a tear, but if you lose 10, 10 pound blocks out of a hundred, I mean, you're the one filling those bags up and, and doing all the work on them, moving them around. Once that, once you lose a, a block at that point, you know, it, it hurts a little bit more. Yep. So we get that, uh, trebuchet going, then I might, and then you're fine. Then you're like, oh, sweet. I, yeah, I can just see Gary. He's going to be all sad. Like, God, I got to like purposely contaminate my shit just so I can <laughs> send those trikes to my, my, uh, competitor. Dude, you might. So you're going to start doing those episodes and like that could be the end of every episode for you, man. That could just be you <laughs> launching a couple of bricks, man. That would be. I fun. love it, dude. And then you get oh, a, yeah. a, a get a little app creator to make a little trebuchet uh, mushroom, like Myco trebuchet app, and we all get addicted to it. It'd be great. All right, so so sorry, total tangent. So okay, so this room, this this uh, fruiting tent here, this yes. is within the the quan set. Yes. How much of the quan set? real estate is this taken up so each one of those little squares is a 10 by 10 square okay. it's a 1500 square foot and i did a 30 by 10 fruiting tent okay. and my plan is to every batch i'm going to build out a new rack and then uh until i hit my my third flush so i'm i'll probably have two of these tents which is 600 square feet and uh the rest will be 
Um, in the back left corner, I have a like a station set up for all of my water. So I'm I have a big reservoir and you know it, uh, a few drip lines that are or not drip lines, but uh, lines that are going to my humidifier, which is like right where this picture is being taken. Okay. And then uh, I, my plan is to have all my bagging. Um, being done there with like automated bagger once I can uh, get to that point in business <laughs> um, right now I'm just hand scooping everything but right. it doesn't seem to be that much of a bottleneck and then um and then to the back right I have all my cleaning supplies maybe that's you know a hundred square feet and then uh, my lab and incubation is kind of like as I'm getting closer. And then I have a uh, pick and packaging station, which is about 100 square feet. And then I have uh, about 100 square foot of space for receiving uh, materials and like storing pellets and bags. And then to the left of there, I'm actually going to be moving my home gym into like 100 square foot because sometimes I like to just work out and... um, you know, get my mind set before I have right. to do my work. So one block in one hand, one block in the other. <laughs> just doing some military presses, Gary. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, we just ended up getting a trailer and we're going to be doing two farmer's markets. So we're uh, dividing and conquering this year with the little one. And um, yeah, so slowly I'm shifting everything there. We okay. still are working on scaling up our electric and, uh, like we talked about early on, it's everything's a challenge in the mountains. Like just to uh, install a new pole, they have to bring in like a helicopter and dig a, a hole down. And there's a, only a few people in the state that are qualified to do that type of work. So it's it's a waiting list and um, content, it's though, a, bro. Content. Yeah, you're gonna get that helicopter shot, dude. You're gonna get that oh my helicopter god, shot. Yeah, so oh, it's good. it's you know it's a it t- it has helped me develop my patience as as a father and as a business owner and i think that you know and enjoying the process is very important for especially mushroom farming um there's a lot of uh there's a lot of failure and like a big learning curve and i'm just grateful to get to this point and be able to serve twice as many people now so it's like you know that's that would make that's what makes me feel good is going to the farmers market and seeing the same customers um, come back week after week. And this so are is you going to are be, you really yeah. moving uh, like all your volume is going to just to the farmers markets or do you have like cooks and kitchens um, and so I would say sixty to sixty five percent is farmers markets and then I do uh, CSA programs which are like a crop share. Oh, right. So there's a place in Arvada, which is up north in Denver, and they've been working with us for three years now. So every Friday, this uh, group of farmers comes and they pick up uh, like bulk mushrooms and then they distribute them to, um, they have a bunch of customers that sign up almost like a, like Hello Fresh. So they get like a box of produce every week. Hello Mush. Um, yeah. Yes. And then, uh, we we also do a co-op, which they just recently moved down to Trinidad, which is like bordering New Mexico. Okay. And um, so shout out to the co-op at first. So they are going to be another distributor. Um, and then, yeah, two farmers markets. So and then we're planning on having open hours on Fridays before. So if uh, people don't want to go to the market or they're you know trying to get their shopping done early. That's going to be um, a new new plan for this cool. this year. So, yeah, up until this point, our bottleneck has been production. But now I feel like expansion. Then you have to worry about distribution, and it's this very fine right. balance. Um, but yeah, we ha- we don't really uh, do restaurants. Uh, we had someone that was buying our mushrooms for a food truck at one point, which is really cool. Um, but we haven't heard from them. And then we were working with someone who made a mushroom broth. So they were, they were buying our mushrooms for a while. And, um, 
yeah, we just kind of, uh, I would say we, we, we prefer the direct to consumer because I think that you get the most reward. There's no middleman. Um, and then I just like the, the direct feedback. Um, oh yeah. You get yeah. that, the gratification of actually seeing the smile on people's faces and, and you know, then that, that initial sale, they come back the next week and you're like, Oh, this is awesome. They really like these mushrooms. I imagine you've built, you know, like sort of informal relationships with a lot of those people. Um, I Absolutely. It's very rewarding. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Awesome. So this is our fifth year in a row doing that. And uh, every time it's like, I would say about half of our customers are repeat customers. And then I would say half are like uh, mushroom curious people. And, you know, sometimes they're from out of state. Sometimes they're, uh, you know, visiting family. So right. it's it's a good mix of people. And like, yeah, it just is, it's very nice to, especially the first week, which is coming up next Saturday, May 6th. Um, at, we get to see familiar faces all returning. And yeah, and this is morale Gary comes season. down from his haunches in the mountains. Oh, yeah. Carrying yeah. his baskets of mushrooms. Yes. Yeah. That's awesome. we're, we're just packed in a little Subaru. We got a Subaru Forester with a roof rack. And then, uh, yeah, we just got a new truck too. Wait, you so live that... in Denver and you have a Subaru. <laughs> what? Yeah. That's yeah. Odd. So it's pretty stereotypical, <laughs> but I think, I think it's a great car. Yeah, All wheel drive. Six That's what you're clearance. supposed to say, Gary. That's what you're supposed to you're, you're, You just keep fulfilling the stereotype. It's great. Yep. <laughs> it's a great car. I get a lot of miles on it. Oh yeah. It's practical four cylinder but with all wheel drive so what more can you ask for yeah that's great um all right so business is going well you're you're probably expanding mushroom production the etsy's still going that's you're you're still an absolutely fantastic source for for mushroom uh, gourmet mushroom liquid cultures um got some cool gear as i pointed out before um yep. this is absolutely on my head most days i i this is my go-to hat you know, I got to keep these pretty for the camera. I can't wear these all the time. So Gary, Gary's hats on my head all the time, taking the kids to soccer practice and all that. Awesome. Yeah. Um, Spread the uh, word. Sp oh, yeah. Oh, you know what, though? What's nice about this, unlike my hat, where I get like these construction worker guys <laughs> who grow cubes and they're like, yeah, man, I'm getting a lot of shit for wearing this hat at work. <laughs> So I started, yeah, I, I did a couple that, yeah, yeah, the they, they're like patch. maybe a little less, less rainbow. So yeah, the, you know, I, I got to get a hat like this, that, that, that way they'll, 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 they won't catch so much flack for it. Sometimes people ask like, oh, is it a statement? It's not a statement for like a, a, a population of people. It's just a logo. You know, it's, uh, I'm using a rainbow in my logo that it's, that's the statement. Right. But philosophy. And rainbows, those kind of correlate, in my opinion, right? Oh, anyway, yeah. Anyway, so, Especially all right. Especially if you go like this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay. Quan sets, new kids, more mushrooms, helicopters with telephone poles dangling from them. It's all, it's all exciting day in the life stuff for, for Gary Hefferly. Um, I reached out to Gary because I have been struggling to find somebody to talk about cordyceps cultivation. I've, I've reached out to William Padilla Brown. I reached out to USA cordyceps. I've reached out to a handful of other people that were recommended to me by people requesting that I do videos about cordyceps cultivation. And so I have just really, you know, anytime somebody says, Hey, try this person, I try them, but, but I haven't been successful and uh, I forget what it was, but uh, Gary liked something of mine recently, or I saw something of his, and it just popped in my head. Wait a minute. I think this guy sells cordyceps. He's grown cordyceps. Gary's going to be nice to me, right? I won't have to beg him too hard to come onto the podcast. And I, it only took an hour, guys. I only had to beg and plead for an hour and promise to send him a, an undisclosed sum of money. But here he is. <laughs> here he is. All right. So, yeah. so we're yeah. going to talk about it now. Um, under no circumstances are you claiming to be the cordyceps god, right? No You're not the master of cordyceps, <laughs> but, 
but you have definitely grown some cordyceps militaris. I've seen the pictures. Absolutely. So, yeah. So let's get into, I guess, start off with your, I want to hear the story of the Gary before he ever grew cordyceps. What led you to want to try growing them? And then uh, mm -hmm. I think of particular interest would be uh, that initial learning curve. What was really different about it? How did you mm -hmm. approach growing a completely different species? Um, so many of these gourmets, they don't really operate too differently from one another. They can use the same, you know, uh, master mix blocks. Humidity isn't too different, just some subtle adjustments. But cordyceps, it's a whole nother beast, right? Absolutely. Right. Yeah, so. Hit us. All right. So I'm going to have to think back when I first learned about cordyceps. So I think back in 2018 at the Telluride Mushroom Festival, I remember I bumped into a uh, fresh cap Tony. Um, yeah. 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 So he was visiting with his wife and I briefly, you know, bumped into them and set, you know, recognized them from the social media world. And I, I think he was either in line for a talk about cordyceps or it was at like the local pub that was on main street. And then there was a talk going on about cordyceps, but that was the first time I ever heard okay. about it. And, uh, um, I don't remember who was giving the talk, but it was about the possible use of entomopathogenic fungi i think it was trad cotter now that yeah. i remember yeah. um and he was talking about there was a beetle that was destroying some uh grape crops out in the you know the eastern coast somewhere and someone drove like i don't know like 200 miles to his farm in in carolina and uh dropped off this specimen of cordyceps and he had a whole slideshow about it and I looked up, you know, Fresh Cap Tony, and I think that they had some cordyceps powder. And I'm like, what is this? So right. then I started getting into the rabbit hole. Okay, so cordyceps has this compound called cordycepin, which is very similar in structure to uh, ADP or the energy molecule. Right. And somehow <clears throat> it, it enters your cell metabolism and it gives you energy um or it up it up regulates your body to produce energy so i i think that i tried a host defense tincture a cordyceps tincture um and there was some other products that were coming out at the time like my friend zach who i teach classes with he got like this big ball it looked like a ball of hash and he was like like breaking off chunks and he he let me try a piece and it was like a concentrate that someone had made um they did like some cold water extraction and it was like this big silvery brown ball of like cordycepin and whatever other you know compounds came off and i tasted it has a really unique flavor um and then from that point on i uh you know I started diving deeper into the cordyceps world. Um, I, I messaged some people about getting different cultures, um, and I managed to get my hands on about three or four different cultures of cordyceps, and maybe that was like 2019-ish. Um, and around that time, I, I had learned about uh, William Padilla Brown, who he wrote the Cordyceps Cultivation Handbook, which if anyone is interested, I highly recommend looking up that book as a resource. I remember there's like a, a moo moo cow recipe or something which had milk and rice. And I'm like, oh, I have all these materials. So I'm going to try to make this substrate. So that one of the major differences is that cordyceps is a entomopathogenic fungi. So it feeds on insects. Um, if anyone has watched uh, that HBO show, The Last of Us, uh, they don't eat humans, so you don't have to worry about that. But it's kind of like a, a parasitic mushroom, and it, it eats insects, and then they climb up a tree or often like on the underside of a leaf, and then it will fruit out so that it could sporulate and spread. And that's how the life cycle of the mushroom is. It's uh, you know very unique in nature. So 
um, someone discovered that they could grow it on rice. So um, that was like a big, you know, event that you didn't have to have like insects that you inoculated and then grow one little mushroom on one insect. You can right. cultivate it on rice. So I tried it and I could not get cordyceps to fruit for, you know, four or five different trials. Um, then I finally got a, a good culture. And then um, at that time, there was a, a group uh, mile high mycology. So uh, Julian, he's one of the, the co-founders of that. And he kind of coached me through what I was doing wrong. So at first I was uh, growing them in half pint jars and my substrate was maybe like an inch tall and that would turn really bright orange, but it didn't have the, uh, the surface area or surface area to substrate ratio that would cause pinning. So one of my first failures was the substrate was too thick. So then I dialed it way down to maybe like a quarter an inch and uh, I got some pin sets, but then, you know, he told me that if you want to do it really good, then you have to put in some work to your broth. So I was just using a basic honey liquid culture, which I still use that now just because it's way less time consuming to get, you know, uh, I don't know, peptone powders and like, uh, you can look up a hundred different recipes on the internet and they all are pretty good um, and dialed in. You can look up scientific papers on the cultivation of cordyceps, or like I said, William Padilla Brown had some really like three part, really easy three part recipes that I tried. And recently um, I had switched over to Instead of using rice, I switched to wild bird seed and I had really good results because it had, you know, an abundance of various different grains. Um, and then my most recent, I was using Milo and just for the heck of it, I took like a pinch of Milo grains from like the bottom of my, uh, my grain spawn bin that I was like scooping my bags in. I just took the leftovers, put it in a jar, sterilized it inoculated with LC and the mycelium covered the entire bottom of the jar, like maybe five grams worth of grain. And it produced, you know, quite a bit of cordyceps mushrooms. So that is like another major difference is less is more with cordyceps when it comes to the, uh, the substrate, but then the, uh, the variation of nutrients. Um, I'm not an expert on that part. So I just look up on the internet and try to make a recipe of off of what I have available. Um, and I've had pretty good success with that. So for the past three or four years now, every November through March, um, I try to get, you know, two, three, four batches in. And I, I would say one out of 10 comes out good. Um, and one of another issue with cordyceps. So my latest video that I just did this week was about breeding them. So cordyceps are uh, uh, ascomyces compared to a basidiomyces, which is just a different type of mushroom. It produces ascospores, and it it shoots them from their ASCII, which is Wait, the whoa, structure whoa, whoa, of whoa, the whoa, mushroom. Whoa. It shoots it right. from where? <laughs> I don't know. Don't quote me on from that. From their, uh, um, what? No. <laughs> don't quote it just me on that. Right? But A-S-C-I, um, and it's a different structure than a basidiospore. Mm -hmm. So basidiomyces, okay. like imagine like a club with like four little spores that are starting to emerge, and then it uses pressure to shoot them out, where uh, ascomyces have like these tubules and it kind of like shoots out a spore and they almost look like little like hairs or it looks like if you like shaved your beard over the sink on a Petri dish. Oh, um, okay. So, yeah. So if you, you can go back, watch that video. It's very a uh, time sensitive procedure. So I have tried in the past to collect cordyceps spores on a, a sterile dish and then try to rehydrate those later but it, you can't do it that way um, they they're very sensitive so in order to breed cordyceps 
you have to do it in real time. So you have to have fresh mushrooms available. All right, and then, so I, you you sent me some pictures. Let, so while you're yeah, talking, throw them up. Let, let's pull them up. They might be in the wrong order. If if it's the wrong one, just say it's the wrong one. We'll we'll get the right one up. Yep. So all right, okay. This is a freshly harvested cordyceps, and it's in a sterile petri dish. And uh, I was trying to trim uh, off the longer ones that had had more mature mushrooms, which they kind of looked like more uh, textured. I don't remember the name of the structures, but whatever produces the spores comes very late stage. It's almost like a, a basidiospore spore that's opening its veils and gills, um, but it's just the maturity of the mushroom. So I cut those off, and then um, I think on one of these pictures, I, I was looking at it under a 30x or 10x. So this is a stereoscope, mm -hmm. and the whole entire petri dish is in the field of view, which I like to do that because you have to be able to select one spore at a time with a scalpel, which is very tedious. Um, I recommend everyone try it because then you will respect all the people who are doing the work on, you know, who on breeding these mushrooms. And I, I don't know if I said it before, but cordyceps tend to senesce very quickly. So they mutate pretty quickly. Um, and in order to keep up a good culture, you have to continue, continuously breed them or go back from the slant, and then they will still mutate over time. So it's a very intense process to maintain a cordyceps library, um, which is why I only try to do it once or twice a year. Um, but yeah, so this is a stereoscope here. It goes from 10 to 30x. Um, I think there's a 3x lens, and then the oculars are 10. Um, so that's kind of this picture. And then uh, this is showing the, the real time of when I'm harvesting those cordyceps. And on the lid, I put some uh, Vaseline so that I could stick the mushrooms to the surface of the lid. And then I, I wrote the time because I was harvesting all these different phenotypes. Um, some of them were from the wild. Some of them were previous cordyceps that I had bred. Some were gifted cultures. So I wanted to mix up that gene pool. So um, throughout the course of 45 minutes, I would take the mushroom, stick it on the Petri dish. And then I ended up coming back at about noon or maybe like 1220. And uh, I would look under the microscope regularly to see the concentration of the spores. Because if it's too concentrated, then it's almost impossible to select a haploid. So you would still get clusters and clusters of, uh, you know, fruiting or not fruiting, but germinating spores. But in order to selectively breed and have a purpose of, you know, I know that this haploid has these features. And then later on in three years, I'll cross that really strong one with another cool one that produces lots of like spiky right. phenotypes then I will have to select just a half a spore and then keep it in a slant. And then I can go back to use that. So if that's pretty complicated for some of the viewers, just imagine like collecting like pollen and saving it in like little vials. And then later on, you can take that pollen and sprinkle it on different flowers and you'd get different variations right. of yeah. that mm -hmm. compared to just, you know, going out into a field and picking a bunch of seeds. So that's the purpose of this. And, um, you know, before about, we go on, yeah. I just want to say, um, cause this Vaseline on the top of the, the lid trick, the first time I heard about this, uh, Ed Grand told me you can, uh, sometimes get, uh, isolate haploids doing the same thing with just a piece of gill tissue from, from a mushroom. And you just, you know, dab a little bit of Vaseline on the top, put, put the, the piece of gill in there. And then yep. he said, you know, you put it not quite at 90 degrees, mm -hmm. but just a little tilted. And if you harvest it at the right time, once you rip that gill tissue off, they'll quickly eject and, and sort of spray down the edge. Yep. So I only it's ever almost... isolated one that way. But yeah, that's, you know, that this process. So it's cool to see you using it for a similar reason. Yep. And I don't even remember when I learned it. I just saw a picture on the internet one day. Yeah. I'm like, that's a good idea. Yep. So yep. now what do we see here? 
Okay, so yeah, so this is probably after three hours of that mushroom dropping its spores, Mm -hmm. and those are different um, asco spores, and it to the left is very concentrated, and to the right is more and more sparse. So then the next, I think the next slide, I'll I'll be uh, zooming in a little more, and you can see. there's a region to the top right where I will be able to carefully select one of those ASCO spores before they germinated and get it onto its own um, slant tube. And then the chances of that mating with another cordyceps and being compatible is pretty low. Um, but there's a whole, you know, genetic test you can do for that, which is into that nanopore technology. And um, I could talk about that, but um, basically at this stage, I'm just trying to collect as many single ascospores as possible, which is leading into one of my newer techniques, which is the micro well breeding. So I'm, I'm mm-hmm. making a whole video on that. Um, this is showing a picture of a cordyceps that I grew inside of a, a, a old rum bottle. So I just thought it'd be cool. and. Uh, I was experimenting with different vessels. So I tried to do monotubs and another challenge with cordyceps is they dry out pretty quickly because the substrate's so thin. So if you do a monotub, unmodified tub, um, that seemed to give me the best results and I would have to like tape that top shut. Right. Um, so there, the moisture stayed in and then I did these, uh, these jars. So I just had different shaped jars to see if it would affect the different shape of the mushroom and this was like a tiny little quarter pint jar and it was cool because the mushroom started growing up and then they wouldn't hit the surface they would kind of like wiggle their way towards the outside so i thought that that was like a cool experiment just to play with the different containers for the cordyceps right um and this kind of shows that it's just a, a little tiny layer of grain and then yep. you're inoculating it with the the, the liquid culture Yep. And that's a really small jar. So it kind of looks big in this picture, but it's pretty small, um, almost like just double the thickness of that lid. And uh, my whole, uh, my whole, like, uh, I guess my, my guess or my presumption was that I thought they would hit the roof of that really quickly. And instead, they didn't want to and they kind of like curved. So that I thought that was pretty cool. They're afraid of lids, I guess. Yeah. So then the, yeah, this is the actual mushroom and you can see some spores being, you know, dispersed at the edge of that tip right there. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, uh, that's probably 10 X or 30 X. I don't remember. Okay. Now, so I have a question. These ascospores, they're, they're not like a uh, oval shaped. Right? Nope. They're, they're linear and they're they kind of look spore. like, yeah, they're a linear looking spore, at least from what I'm observing. Right. Um, and then they have like little hairs that kind of like allow them to stick. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, yeah, so two compatible ascospores would have to be in the same vicinity. They germinate, fuse together, form one organism. And then if the conditions are right, then they'll fruit and, um, you know, disperse more spores. Right. So uh, this might be a whole nother thing, but they're, so in nature, they're growing medium is larvae, right? Like, uh, or, or I've seen them growing ants and bugs and different things like that. So mm-hmm. here we're just trying to trick it into thinking it's in, in basically inside an insect of some sorts. But so these spores then, you say they have the barbs on them. Do they have to actually germinate then on the bug? Or do they myceliate in the ground and then the bug eats it or something like that i i haven't actually looked yeah. into this to know i don't know that's a question that's over my head All right next um, topic next uh, yeah next next time we're gonna co- i'm gonna figure it out we're gonna talk about it um but that uh so okay so the thing the takeaways that i'm getting here let me pull this up maybe oh it doesn't want, oh there we go okay just took some time um so the broth, right? You're start. You're always starting with broth. You're not starting with uh, a plate culture 
or, or anything like that. You it, it has so to. So you you can. Um, oh, you can. I think that I don't. I'm not sure why people don't sell those. Um, so they're very light sensitive as well. And okay. um, I noticed when I subculture from plates, it will the mycelium will turn turn orange, and that to me indicates that okay this metabolism starting maybe right. the breakdown of the genetics is happening so in a liquid culture you never really see an orange tinge on the mycelium right um i'm just guessing at this point but i i do have you know dozens of petri dishes and that's how i breed them because you're kind of filtering that three to three dimension surface so you can see that it's clean um and then I usually will just store it on a slant and then keep it in the dark. So keep it in the dark. And then I, I work with it pretty quickly because I, I learned over the course of the, the few years is that once it kind of turns orange, um, I think that there's more like mutations going on. Um, that's just an observation. I, I can't back that up with any science, but it's like a, some kind of a rule that I created is like, okay, make sure these mycelium stays white as long as possible and then get it into liquid culture. It, if it turns orange, it's done. Like it's maybe, gonna, yeah, who knows? Yeah. Well, and uh, people have grown my own uh, cultures that I've bred way better than I've ever grown. So there's a guy, uh, renegade mushrooms and mm -hmm. he sends me pictures all the time of my cordyceps that i bred in my like hyper breeding video and i'm like dang dude like right. better better than i've ever grown like good job i mean but don't you like that like i, I send yeah. spore swabs out all the time and uh people will send me pics and um like I actually kind of like it when I get jealous. It's like, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. You know, it's very humbling. The, yeah. And that's ins inspirational too. I'm yeah. like, well, if he can do that, I can do that too. So mm -hmm. what am I doing wrong? Yeah. I don't do that, Gary. I don't think what am I doing wrong? I just say, hey, that's great. I'm glad you grew that. Now, how did you do it? What do I need to do? Fine. That's a good way to think as well. Yeah. Give me your secret. I'm very self critical, but I also yeah. am very, you know, uh, I'm happy when people have success, yeah. especially when it came from me. So it's like, yeah. it's a win-win. Mm -hmm. Now my favorite though, and this doesn't happen too often, uh, but I remember one guy uh, said, Hey, uh, you sent me some swabs and this is the grow. And you know, what happened? Is it just weak genetics? And I was like, I mean, they were spores, man. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was some spores. Yeah. Like this is the this is the hustle. You germinate them, you see what happens. Yeah, uh, but yeah, usually it's definitely great when people go look at this tub and I go, "Wow, why do why do mine didn't look like that? That looks yep. amazing, man. I love like that. I said, my success is like one out of ten, and I think that just comes with a uh, the time spent focused on cordyceps. Like I would say, cordyceps is a whole different breed. It's a whole different monster, um, but it's very challenging and very rewarding. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I mean, I like to make tea out of it. So that's my favorite way is I'll just. So you still use it. So you, you did feel like all the, the promises, the anti-inflammatory, you know, properties, the, the immune boost, the anti-cancer, the anti-aging. Oh, you know what? I do see the anti-aging. I don't think you've aged a day, Gary. I see it. <laughs> I need to use that. I'm just looking older and get, older. Get on that cordyceps uh, regimen. So but you yeah, like per it? You, personally, you... so I do a lot of hiking in the summer, mm -hmm. um, especially at altitude. And I notice the difference between, you know, when I'm hiking 10,000 feet and I drink a glass of cordyceps tea, I can definitely feel the difference mm -hmm. between if I didn't do it. So um, I think it's it's a kind of one of the more noticeable. Um, functional mushrooms i should say you know obviously like you could feel a microdose and then i would say cordyceps you can feel like the the physiology with lion's mane um you know i feel like my dreams are pretty vivid but i don't notice like it's not like i'm uh watching jeopardy i'm like nailing all the questions but like i feel like with cordyceps like i i'm hiking i'm very in tune with my body 
I could feel the energy. So um, I'm pretty, you know, I'm pretty stoked when I get a fresh harvest. And then right now I have like maybe like a jar's worth just sitting in the fridge. And definitely when I'm going mushroom hunting, I'll I'll drop a few and a glass of tea and um, yeah, enjoy those. So that's all you I, do. You You dry the fruit bodies and then you're just sort of naturally letting them leach into a tea. Yep. So I cool. have been, so that's another, another project. That, so I've been working probably 15 to 18 months on generating a concentrate or uh, producing a concentrate mm-hmm. with cordyceps. I've been sending samples to flourish labs. I have a yep. few different videos on that too, if anyone is interested, but. Um, oh, so you're the reason. Cause I, I saw not too long ago he posted that he can uh, test for quercetin, and I'm like, oh, okay. oh yeah. So it's yeah, he's all... got legit standards, everything. Um, yeah, so I've been sending samples of freeze dried cordyceps, and um, I think that that's the best way to preserve them. Uh, I've always sold my cordyceps fruiting bodies uh, freeze dried, except the very first batch; they were kind of like squiggly and dried. But um, uh, yeah, so freeze dried cordyceps. They're almost like like styrofoam texture, and they they suck up that water, and like you could see the orange come out of them. So it's very satisfying. Um, but uh, yeah, so I do the freeze dried into a tea or a fresh mushroom into tea. Um, I have sold it to a chef before, and he like diced them up really fine and like put them in a soup, which that was kind of cool. And he said it, you know, it t- cordyceps has a really unique scent and flavor. So that's another thing. It's like way different than any, any other mushroom. I don't know how to describe it. It's almost like, like I would say like musty, but it's it's like a sweet mustiness. Um, it's very unique. Like when you crack open a fresh jar of cordyceps, it has like, it hits you like, oh, this is like very unique smell. And I think that the more potent it is, the more that it has that smell, but that's, I haven't verified that, but it's almost like growing anything else. Like if you're growing, you know, basil and it's really aromatic. It probably has more, you know, volatile compounds. So, um, I don't know where I'm going with that, but, oh yeah. So I have been trying to, uh, do a CO2 extraction lately, which is like a solventless extraction right. and, uh, pretty, not good results so far, but every batch I'm tweaking the run times. Um, I'm sending in those in for samples and it's, I'm, I'm trying to produce a product where on every little jar of tincture, it says the concentration and, you know, raise that level of product. Because like I said, I think cordyceps is a, it's a really, you know, apparent feeling when you're consuming it. And a lot of people are selling not tested product and if if you happen to try someone's not tested product and it doesn't make you feel any different then maybe you'll just write off cordyceps but if if there's real products out there that go through testing and you can see the concentration and then every person also every person reacts different to to you know different substances so some people might not even feel it ever or some people might be super sensitive so that is, you know, one of my million side projects that I've been working on for a while. Um, but there's a company in Boulder called Uza Labs. Um, maybe you should have them on sometime. Yeah. And they're developing this uh, tabletop CO2 extraction machine. So I've been submitting them freeze-dried mushrooms every once in a while. Um, they'll just run it when they have time. They send me the sample. I send it out for testing. And then we kind of dial in our process and that's been going on for a while, um, but it's still not what I want. Um, and then on top of that, I only grow cordyceps like three, four times a year. So this is my last batch that I'm going to um, send in for testing. And then in the meantime, I'm breeding them and trying to develop this really awesome strain so that when I do figure out the tincture, that I could scale it up really quickly. So that's kind of my goal. Um, but in the meantime, it's just my hobby. And uh, it's like, uh, yeah, like I said, one of my 12, 
you know, side projects, but uh, it keeps me interested. Well, so I feel like I, so I just got done talking to somebody uh, about growing some exotics and uh, it didn't intimidate me. I was like, okay, it's going to take a little bit more time, but I'm not necessarily intimidated. Mm -hmm. Not going to lie. I feel like cordyceps a little more intimidating, a little little more to it hearing, you know, somebody that's grown a lot of them saying that, you know, one out of 10 times, uh, you know, it's a, it's banging and and, and the other nine, it's not, that's a little, uh, okay. All right. Yep. Here we go. Um, I'll grow them someday. I don't know when, um, I'll have to talk to Renegade Mushrooms and find out what all his little secrets are so I can, uh, because you know me, I just, I got too much going on. So if I'm going to do it, I want to, I want to do it. I want to, I want to. Yep. All right. So my advice, if I can rewind my brain and do like the perfect first run, I would do 12 jars. I would get three different genetics because they could be, you know, different for your substrates and stuff. So three different genetics from reputable vendors. Don't just buy it off some $4 liquid culture, off, you know, some Etsy website with four sales. Like get a good reputable right. strain um, and then go buy William Padilla's Brown's book or look up on the Internet, you know, uh, a tried and true recipe. I would say three parts is good enough. Um but it, if you want to go all in, do the peptone and the carbon and all that okay. powder, do it, do it up and then start off in jars with a mycology lids with the injection ports and the syringe filter. And, uh, yeah, just make sure that you follow the sterilization time. So 90 minutes in a, and 15 PSI, that should be good for the rice, a okay. quarter inch of substrate. Don't overdo the substrate. And uh, you want your inoculation to look a little watery. Like okay. my mistake at the beginning was I would just do three drops and I thought it would spread like a lot of other mushrooms. But you want it to almost be like submerged in water and okay. then that way it won't dry out. And you'll get good results like that. I think that is, you know, what I would recommend. Start off small do the half pint jars with like the straight edges, like a PF tech and then uh, yeah, small substrate. And I think anyone listening to this, they would have success 64 degrees to 50 degrees. So cooler, like think like wine cooler. Um, Anytime for me after April in Denver, it gets too hot during the day. So unless I'm cranking my AC, I'm not growing cordyceps. Man, I like where um, you're then, going with this because my basement is like 60 to 65 during the winter, and I'm kind of getting sick of growing cubes in the in the winter. Uh, it's yeah. just it's too hit or miss for me. So I'm okay. I might I might have a, a yeah. winter crop Qu- here. Cordy season, cordy season, season, November to March. All right. Well, yep. next year then, then. Gosh darn it, I missed it. Yeah, and then if you want to go big, do a, a unmodified tub and uh tape the edge okay and i think those are all the the tips i could give to everyone it takes a while too so like you'll have like this orange cake and be like ah it didn't do anything and then one day you'll see tiny little like um, tiny little pins and then they don't grow like any other mushroom they'll just every day a little bit mm. that's why they like the cold i think or they grow slow because of the cold one of the two but um yeah so be patient they test your patience and then every time you think they're done just let them keep growing because they'll start to develop those spikes and then get it onto auger and watch my video on how to breed them and you know we'll fill up the internet with awesome cordyceps yeah man that's that's so that's really um so i was talking to a guy uh he's a facebook guy uh, he's from uh, Paris, France, and he he used to work in a completely different industry. He's now you know head over heels enamored with with mushroom cultivation, and uh, he managed to happen into a job at an agaricus factory. So he's learning commercial agaricus production, and uh, it's looking like he might even be poised to now take it over. And uh, 
he he's like, man, it's just the secrets. You know, he's like, the stuff I learned in the first week was just blowing my mind. Yeah, and, uh, Agaricus is another beast as well. Right, a um, whole other beast. Yeah, that's something that I braze the surface on. I've been working on uh, almond Agaricus, which I've heard is way different than Agaricus bisporus, which I've done 12 or 15 tubs that never, never fruited. Um, so I don't even know those secrets. You should have that dude on next. Oh, well. <laughs> Well, we'll see if he signed a non-disclosure or not, but yeah. yeah, if, if, if he can talk about it, that, that would be awesome. I, I'm always trying to get him on, but we'll see. But yeah, that's that, you know, that I think it's great. You, you and I have always been aligned in that sense of, uh, you know, just believing in transparency, uh, that transparency is never going to bite you in the ass. It's all, it's always a good, uh, a, a good approach. Uh, we're trying to build a community of, uh, mushroom enthusiasts. You know, if, if this, if it's just the same number of people, it's, and not growing, we have the same number of people advocating. We get the same outcomes. Like we, we only have a lobby and, and uh, can advocate for our interests as this community grows. So sharing that information and building that knowledge base uh, for all passionate cultivators, I, I think that's really really the secret. And, and you clearly do that. I, I know you said in the first time you came on, uh, you said like, I just wanted to document my journey, but obviously it's evolved beyond that now, you know, now you, you, you really know that, oh, I'm, I'm learning this thing and I can share that with people. And then they get that benefit of not having to take 12 hours trying to figure yeah. something out. I can just tell them, well, I figured it out for you. Absolutely. And, uh, the internet is a very tough critic too. So I feel like I get feedback almost immediately and i've right. come up with well i've i've released content and gotten positive feedback which amplified my knowledge almost as much as i'm putting out so it's right. like a like a symbiosis yep. with information and i feel like there's people out there that are gatekeeping and it's only like a black hole for information right. like if you s keep you know, hammering down that, uh, I would say advancement or like, if you're like, it's like trying to push back fog, like it's yep. going to make its way out. And then it's only going to hurt you in the long run because then 100%. no one's going to want to tell you what to do. So that's kind of my philosophy is, okay, I'm providing value to this community. And then every once in a while I get a tidbit back and also i'm only on this earth for a small period of time and within that time i'm only productive for an even smaller period of time so right. if i can you know maximize my production just by you know sharing my ideas then i feel like it's going to move the needle even more and then you know when i'm on my deathbed i could just think back right. okay i gave it all that's a it's a weird way that my brain thinks but um I love, you know, sharing my ideas and I love having these conversations. And I think that every time that I do it by teaching it, I'm learning more oh, as well. 100%. So, yeah. yeah. So these are all the thoughts that I have. And I wish that, you know, more people would think like that. Um, right. There's so much demand for these mushrooms that, you know, I heard someone get upset because, they were like, oh, this place in Utah, this lady said she's going to get like 100,000 square feet, all cordyceps mushrooms. I'm like, good, good, because that's going to allow for a lab to start testing for those right. compounds. And the lab will actually be supported by the amount of volume. Like right. th that's a, a progressive movement. Right. But don't be like spiteful that someone is investing into that movement because they're creating value it's it's Correct. such a weird yeah. weird thing hey man well i i like you uh i've liked you from from day one uh love having you on uh so glad you've joined the 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 fatherhood tribe um and all that comes from that you know we all do our myceliating and uh you know I, and you're worth listening to, not just because you have a, a, a map of the, the world behind you, Gary. It's, it's because oh, yeah. you're willing to be transparent. You put your ideas out there. 
Um, I just love all that. So anyway, thank you for being on uh, again. It won't be the last time. Um, and uh, hopefully next time uh, we're on, I, I can, I'm ready to be that guy. I want to show you, look at my cordyceps. Look at them. So I saw this guy from Austin, Texas today, posted a video, coolest video. He had like two trays of cordyceps uh-huh. and he has this crazy hair. It looks just like him. I'm like, right. those cordyceps have his energy. Oh, yeah. um, I don't remember who it was, but it was on Instagram somewhere. Guy from Austin, Texas with crazy hair. Check it out. But anyway, oh, yeah. thank you so much oh, for, yeah. you know, having me on. I love having these conversations and I I could talk mushrooms all day, but I think I could hear. Well, you're, you're definitely yeah. going to be one, one, one of the regulars, you know, we'll, right. you know, you, and like I said, I, I think I said this last time, anytime you got something you want to talk about, let me know. We'll get you on. We'll talk about it. Absolutely. I do. So. But, but for real, somebody out there, get him some plans. And if I got to drive out there oh and help him God, build dude. this uh, slingshot, we're going to do it. It's happening. I love it. I, I love know. it, dude. All, All right. right. And, well, until next time, talk to you later. Yeah. Much love, everyone. All right, guys. Well, that was Gary Hefferly of Fresh from the Farm Fungi. A uh, great guy. Solid dude. He believes in a lot of stuff. I believe in transparency, uh, you know, you know, supporting the community, uh, giving back. Uh, trying, trying to be an ethical vendor, all that stuff, super important, uh, in, in building our community up, uh, definitely aligned with, with, with the mission statement for this podcast. Um, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be keeping, keeping an eye on Gary for a long time here. We always want to know what he's up to. Uh, <clears throat> well, thanks for tuning in. I had a great time, uh, zaps, some exotics, uh, some, some, some just really interesting, uh, crosses from Jeff. And, uh, uh, so shout out to Sillivibe, shout out to Jeff Karras, shout out to Gary Hefferly. You guys, uh, uh, made it a great, great episode. I, I had a lot of fun. Um, so, uh, next week, stay tuned for, for more action. Uh, I, I, I don't know who's going to be on, on, on the dock yet. I'm just getting used to this transition, uh, into pre-recordeds. Um, so a lot of that's going to depend upon uh, availability of guests, and I'm just working on on getting that all slotted out. But uh, I I got a few people lined up, and uh, hoping they all work out. They're they're going to be real interesting characters. So uh, stay tuned uh, until next week. Uh, happy mushroom cultivation. Mm-hmm.